I'm Mr. C. Sargent. And I'm Rosina Sargent, his wife. Of 30 Clabbits Avenue Bills, aged 82 and a half. Born at Little Hawkley in 1906. My father was a horseman and he used to drive steam engines in the 1900s and onwards. He was a hay and straw tire and a thatcher as well. When I was six years old, I had to help in the garden when I got to nine years before I went to school. I went from Ardberries of Little Hawksley Hall to fetch milk and butter and, and eggs. When I got back to the hall with them, I went to Whiston Hall to get them, but when I got back to the hall, I had to go straight to where my father worked with his tea, where he was at work in the fields. When I was 10 years old, I started work for Keeble and Keeble. Three of us boys used to feed 300 pigs night and morning. On, on Saturdays, I went with a horse and cart to Whiston Mill for pig food. In 1916, I cut 30 acres of beans with a horse mower. I drove the horses, empty wagons to the fields, and uh, took the loaded ones home. After harvest was finished, on Friday night sometimes, I went with a milk float with two calves and the cows following behind. When I got to Colts Station Meadow, I would leave them on the meadow with the, with the muzzles on the calves, and the drivers on Saturday mornings would pick them up and drive them to the market, on, and I would go with pigs and, and go down to the hive after slab cake for the cattle. In, 19, in 1919, my father moved to Bewas to work for Chambers and Son. I went to school for one year at Bewas. When I left, a lady called Miss Paul from uh, from Mr. She came to our house and asked if I would start a milk brown for her. So Mr. Dredge bought some cows, went out and bought some cows and ate short horn cows. I milked them night and morning and went round Warrenford with the milk in a donkey cart. After three or four months, this Miss Paul wanted a stronger man. So in the late spring, Mr. Emery came to the door and asked if I would like to take two horses of blackness. When I got back, he asked if I would load, if I could load some hay. I said yes, and I worked for him for 22 years. As horseman, cattle, sheep, and pigs used to do all kinds of farm work. In 1939, I was kicked by a horse and burst, and it burst my kidney. And I fell on a brick wall and hit me head. Between the 1920s and 30s, I used to drive fat bullocks to market and I drove cattle to Mark's Day to Norfolk's of Mark's Day Hall, and sometimes brought as many home. In 1941, I left and went to Boxford for Mr. Lowshack. For two years then, a Mr. Walker took over, and I was foreman for two years. Then I came back to Bills to Rovers Hall for four years. When I was in the cow parlor hand milking 
this gave us one Sunday, Captain Moran walked in and he wanted me to start the farm up at Fish House as farm foreman. I was there till he retired, 25 years. Then I was four and a half years, then I was uh, 64 years, then I was 64 and a half years old. Mr. Crackman came after me then to help him out on the farm. After I left, there's another place I got here, I missed out. After I left school, that's right, have you right? Yes, go on. After I left school, some nights I used to go to Stanley Deves as a boss, making crystal and one wire Val Wallace sets. And I used to play steel kites at some of the pubs as well as darts. When I wanted to come home from hospital, I asked the, if the staff to ask one night if I could go home. She said, I will ask the doctors. Two doctors came in, looked at me. They said yes, because I never smoked. In the, in, if I smoked, it would have all turned septic, so it healed the self. That's your kidney operation. Yes, that's yeah. the, what I've got all wrote down. Yes. Now, uh, Oh dear. <laughs> when, when you went to when, when I went to Little Hawks for school, the teacher always used to get on us with cane if we was late to school. But then I uh, was going out with my father's tea and the milk that made me late. So you, she used to use the cane on us a lot. But uh, but when that come to Christmas time, I was writing out a piece about. Uh, plum puddings and the teachers asked us about putting carrots in it and I made the girls behind laugh. When uh, they laughed she said come out Lord Sergeant and she was going to use the cane on me hard but I just hit her underneath the, and knocked her over I said but I was only nine years old then so uh, I had to go to another school. So uh, right, uh Great old thing. After, the, after that, my brothers died. My brother died in uh, 1915 yeah. in the World War from uh, a doc, German doctor vaccinating him with, uh, and he had the pneumonia. My other brother came home and he asked me where father and mother was. And, I, we, me and my other brother said that the, they were down in Port Slade burying my brother. And uh, he went right into the army at 17 and a half, and he went to France. Then he went to Italy, and he came back to France again, and he got killed at 20 and 3 months. Which, which battle was he in when he got killed, you know? That's where it was. Yeah, well, yeah, the Somme or uh, anywhere like that. Uh, you uh, don't know. I, I, couldn't, I, no. got, I couldn't say now just where he's, yeah, where he's been. I've got the letters in there somewhere, yeah. but. Uh, be a job to find them. Yes. Be a job to find them. Yes. And you've got a letter, Mrs. Sardin. Sorry, now? Yes. yes. That, that came from the, from the parson yes. to Claude's mother, didn't it? That's right. I'll put these glasses on. Okay. I've put um, Scarf's Corner, Great Hawksley, Essex. Dear Mrs. Sergeant, I am very, very sorry to hear of your terrible loss. Please accept my deepest sympathy. I will not come round. I'll see you just yet. I do not feel that I can. I have been round and seen so many of late that I can see no, cannot bear it just yet. I will come round and see you in a week's time. It is a terrible thing, but here is my hopeful in the little in life worth waiting for. But now death is worth waiting for when you will let more be joined, don't you see it now, with your dear sons on the... I can't understand that word. Sons on the... On the rescue time morning, when late will be as... Late will 
pity as more weeping, so no more power. Your son has died for the country and has laid his life down for his friends, as, as it were. Our kind said he who it were, our kind said he would, okay, who laid down his life for his friends, I can understand that properly. Has been greatest love from you, maybe fight when that he will be received by God into heaven. For had he done, lived a long life, he would have done uh, no more than he has done to his worthy of everlasting life in heaven. I thought there, there must have been something the matter on Sunday because when I asked uh, uh, Claude to stand up, he stood and not stall and not as he not as he was with his back to the congregation. He walked straight out into the vestry, and I am very sorry indeed if I had hurt his ch hurt your child, feeling as I had no idea that I had said anything out of the ordinary to have upset him. And now to see that the poor child must have been grievously for his brother and 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 went I can't understand well, can you see that word, please? Can he has been where you got to brother and you come. And uh, and so went out. Mr. Sergeant, Mrs. Sergeant, my prayer go out for you in in your great distress. May your comfort you in your bereavement. If you will let me know what Sunday you will, I will have a memorial service for you son near is the least that we um, can honor his brave life and I remain your sincerely T.B. Singleton assistant curator. And what date was that called? Is it, is it dated? The letter dated? Is it got it's a on date Tuesday, on? but it doesn't, it doesn't say the date. No. no, it doesn't say the date, does no, it? No, no, no. no. No, no. No more, is no. it? No, no. No. Or at Hadley. I mean, when you were single. When I was single, and I, was, and I, I lived at Hadley, and uh, you, my husband came over to see me, didn't you? No, you picked me up on the... Picked you up on the Anchor Bridge in, the, in Nayland. <laughs> and then he came over to see me. Yes. And, and then... Your maiden name was? Uh, Ro uh, Rosina Cundy. Uh, yes. Yes. And what else can I put? And then I say we got to go. You worked at Dwight Hart. Worked at Dwight Hart, yes. Pinched me coat. P yes, we pinched his coat when he came to see him. Then that caught a light, and then you we well, was looking out the window to see if we'd gone home. And then the girl, his daughter, she, she opened the window and the curtains caught a light, and you had to come back and try and put it out, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and you've got two children? Dad, I've got two children, a boy and a girl. My daughter's the oldest. Um, do you want to know the ages? Well, grandchildren. You get the, every, your grandchildren. Every grandchildren. Then I've got three grandchildren. One is uh, 36 this coming March, and the other one is 19, the boy, and the girl is 17. Okay. Yes, and uh, what else could I put? And they went, my daughter won a scholarship when she was 11 down to school. And then she went to high school in Sudbury. Yeah. When I was uh, nine years old, I uh, used to go sometimes after a load of turnips on a Saturday morning, and the horse jibbed and backed in a uh, nine foot ditch as I was going up a hill. And uh, the horseman from the Lower Dairy Farm went to pull, a, pull it out, and he hooked two horses on the neck and broke his neck and killed him. And uh, then other. Saturday mornings in the springtime and long time, I used to lead a donkey 
and with a dentist mower, and the man used to be me the guard, and he used to be behind, holding the mower. And, uh... I'll say then I was born at... Yeah, I, I right. was in a sergeant, a candy. Yes. Uh, and, I was, and I was born at Foxford. And, was that right? And christened at, um, and Foxford Church. Yeah. And I used to work at Hag... I met my husband on the Anchor Bridge. And he used to come over and see me, and then I came over to Wiston and we got married. And I hope my grandchildren, you, I've got two children, one boy, I mean one daughter and one boy, and then I've got three grandchildren, one... My name, Reginald Roy Slack. Born 1906. That's 1906, yes. And uh, I had a pretty good time, I can't grumble. A friend of mine asked me to come down and make this film and give you a little bit of a life in China. I have plenty of it, believe you me. I joined the Navy in 25. I'd done 12 years. Came out, got called back for the war. As a matter of fact, I was on the reserve and I was called up and I'd done three months of training before the war started. And I, of course, I had to go through with that. I had quite a good time. I, I can't grumble about my life. I've got around and seen things and I've enjoyed them every minute of it. Sometimes you get a slap in the face, but what's that? You've got to put up with it, haven't you? Now, uh, first ship I was on was a big full funnel cruiser, HMS Weymouth. I think it was the hardest steaming ship and everybody reckoned in the Navy at the time. She was the hardest steaming ship that ever was afloat. Anyway, we were all bus, 1925, and uh, we were going to China. We were all young and And uh, we used to plod along. P.O.s used to drive here. Petty officers, that is, used to drive you around, think they were doing something good. But you always had the tone of them, you know what I mean? I really enjoyed it. Because you had your bad times as you had your good ones. Only thing, when, you, when she, she wallowed well, the old Weymouth, HMS Weymouth, and on her way out to China, she'd get these torrent rains, you get the wash and everything. You had old wood lockers. You had to keep your kit in. And uh, it was rough, it was hard. But blimey, mountains are put in there for you to climb, aren't they? And uh, we got by. When you had a kit master, you'd take your gear mark it up and everything, I lay it all out. People who didn't have it, you just went round, put the name on the other side, laid it out for them, they got away with it. We all worked together then. That's what people are not doing now, I don't think. They just seem to go against each other. But in them days, it was lovely. We used to work together, really work together. And uh, per ship, as I say, was the old Weymouth, big four, four funnel cruiser. And by Jesus, I've never worked so hard in my life. Coal, I think we used to eat coal. And the old boilers used very sluggish. They should have been taken out of service about 20 years before, I think. 
They went over through the First World War, and I done quite good there, because they were new ships. But when we got up, by Jesus, she was bad. But we struggled on. And uh, everywhere we went, we were there. You went ashore. Of course, Stokes with the old coal, you went as a, as a black-eyed Susan. You know, all the black round your eyes, you could do what you like. A lot of them used to put butter on to keep the cold up out of their eyes so that they could clean them up well. I never used to bother. I used to rub them out. Got a bit of soap in and I used to have wash them off. You had to. But uh, I can't grumble at that. It keeps hard work in the old moment. Really hard. Still, she's been an old ship, hasn't she? She should have come down about ten years before, but never did. Well, I can say this much with all what name when I joined the Navy. I was out of work at the time. I went in Fleet Street, tried to get paper round or something, get in the print, do this and do that. But everybody was full up. There was thousands, millions of unemployed. So coming down Whitehall, I've been over there looking for work, coming down Father Square, down Whitehall, the recruiting centre was there. The Navy one queue at the old post run. I thought, well, what do I see about this? You know, I wanted a job. I didn't want to know for that. I was never a for in my life. So I went and got in the service. Saw it and everything. I had the health and strength to pass. I know there were bigger blokes than me. There were about 27 of us went up to Whitehall. Examined by the doctor. He came out, he shouted two words. I forget the other bloke's name now. Come on, what me name? Slack. Slack and somebody else was the only two that passed out the lot. And I was fair at the time. I'd been boxing for the Lynn Athletic Boxing Club. When uh, Ted Broadrib had it, he was the instigator of that, you know, and uh, Freddie Mills was all on the go, because his daughter got married to Freddie. But they were all good times, you know what I mean? You work together, you seem to work together more than people do now. They don't want to knock one another down now, only these scallywags you meet on the road. And they want to dive down your pockets, and half of them, I think, are neck bones. I do, honestly. But there you are, what can you do now? At the age of 83, there wasn't no whacking now. Buff a window blow you over. But there you are. Well, anyway, I went to the, this Weymouth, HMS Weymouth. By God, she was a terrible ship. Terrible ship. Worked day and night, worked day and night. And you had to be half dead before they'd give you a dose of opening mixture, I think, on that ship, the Weymouth. Everybody tried a malinga, but there was no malinga in that. I know I had to go myself. That's how I know. But uh, we could took her out of China, in Hong Kong. There was this HMS Carlisle we were going to. God, she was lovely. She was lovely. All done out with white enamel inside and everything. And she had the old raised forecastle. She was only an overgrown destroyer. She was a small cruiser. Only an overgrown destroyer, as I say, but by God, she looked smart. She looked just been painted. Well, the crew on the Carlisle came over, and we went across where they came from, and we had the Carlisle. Of course, football teams, cricket teams, everything, everything, you know. And I, I mean to say, when you say you had a a China fleet, you had a China fleet then. 
cruisers, the small boats, submarine, submarine parent ship. You had all them. Makes you wonder where the Navy is today. You never hear of them, never see them. But I saw all that lot. And uh, all a couple of them turned over to submariners. You were allowed to do that. But I didn't fancy that. It's bad enough on top of time without going underneath it. I thought, anyway. And I was all, after all said and done, I was looking old to myself. Well, anyway, I got in and I met my brother in law, George Pascoe. That flows brother. Him and I powered up. In fact, that's how I went out with Flo. We've done the longest commission recorded since the First World War. That was three years, two months and two days. And uh, when we came home, had a good time in China, right inland. But of course, when we went up the Yangtze, we didn't know, go no further than Ankau. That was the top part of the lower river. You had lower, another load uh, that was intermediate, do you call it, and then the top river. You had three parts of it. Well, we used to get as far as uh, Hankow. What Hankow, yeah. And uh, that's as far as we got at that time. But I got round China. I know we went out one day and they said, oh, they got a a big duel going on out on the square, in Hong Kong. Uh, Kowloon, sorry, used to get the ferry across from Hong Kong across to Kowloon, and that was China, you see, but of course Hong Kong was pretty. Anyway, they caught uh, some pirates or something, they pinched a ship, and anyway, they were beheading them. We went over there. Of course, all done up. We're going to see this. We had him war, oh, God, I mean, I better run off. He said, oh, I said, but uh, it knocked you, you know what I mean? You went there, you see these people laughing and joking and everything. And they were the blokes who were going to have their heads locked off. They were really the blokes who were going to have their heads locked off. <laughs> and they were laughing and joking as the bloke had his head chopped off. Right neat round there, you know. <laughs> Just missed the bottom of the jawbone there. You saw it? Yeah. Yeah. Body kicking around, his hands tied behind his neck. Yeah. He's back there, and when the ropes come over his neck, yeah. he's kicking around like anything, running with no head on. <laughs> Marvellous. <laughs> oh, well, I think it's a marvel to put it running around there with no head on. Not up, but on the shoulder, yeah. like, and just running round in the circle. Yeah. No way done. Yeah. Of course, that was all done away afterwards. I think they might do it now. They used to have the hacking new pieces, a thousand pieces, take the body, chain it up and that, yeah. and pull bits out of you. Really pull it right out of your flesh, everything, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Oh, it used to be torturous out there, then a proper primitive. Yeah. When I was over a whole country, they were really primitive, you know, in their ways. Well, anyway, I, I on the car, we were out there three months, uh, three years, two months and three days, time we got home again. Of course, quite a few, I used to allow the old girl a pound a week. And uh, she wrote, she said she didn't want all that money off me, a pound a week. I said, you could have had a lot if you wanted to. When I got home, she said, uh, Oh, young Jack, I've got something for you. She got me a bank book, 187 pounds in the bank. But I said, I went and drew it all out. I said, everybody in Woolworth, I said, I think was drunk. You know, I, I think they were all drunk on that. But uh, they all had a good time. All the presents and flows got some now. My wife's got some in there now. 
that I sent them my mother, who brought home the old fire screen, all inlaid with mother of pearl. That's still there, I know. I said, that was one thing I wouldn't let my brothers pinch. I said, and several other little things anyway, I said, oh, I've got, I said, the wife prejudice them, I don't know. I said, I, I've seen enough of them. But anyway, I always wanted to go, as I say, I wanted to go uh, into China, or further into China. And Ankau was the furthest I could get on a proper ship. So I volunteered for Chinese gunboats. And they were little small ships. And they were the, the three best ones that had just been gone up there brand new was the Turned, Gannet and Petrel. And uh, I volunteered for the Turn. Too much to my surprise, we got it. I got it. And uh, anyway, we trooped out there again, went up half out to Nankin, I think it was, somewhere there. And uh, we met the boat, and we changed over. I went to her, and uh, oh, blimey, frightening. Frightening up there when you went through these gorges. You go right through the gorges, right up, right up to Nankin, uh, to, uh, what was it? Oh, my black mind. I just can't. But I say we were just now. Never mind, Jack. Huh? Never mind. Carry on. Get the name of it. Uh, yeah. You went up as far as you could go. And have a good walk. Chung Kim. Oh, yeah. Chung Kim was as high as we could oh. go there. As far as our uh, Chung Kim. And she used to go with rapids on her own. You'd be down below in the firing space, honey, had two little boilers. And she was turbo. And they were pretty good. She said, uh, you sing out, stand by Stokes, give her all she's got. So we used to belt it on. You were doing 4,000 reps that you went into it. And she hit, shut her, and the bow wave used to go as high as a funnel, each side. And you might put up that, that the best part of half an hour. When you got over there, you were all right, you went along again. But you had about three lots of them to do, so you should learn how to look and behave yourself with them. But we go right into Chunk End, right up to Chunk End, I've seen them beard them, bearded, pick them to pieces, all everything. The torture they used to have there then, supposed to be the most sophisticated nation in the world, they told us, or the oldest sophistication in the world. But I don't know about that, I'd rather have been a town here any time. And still, money had to be owned, you couldn't waste your life. All the places we went to, Mora, Gibraltar, Mediterranean, Port Said, uh, all, all them places, Singapore. It was quite nice to get there, you know. It was standing around three corners, which they were doing at the time, 1924, 5 and 6. Things were very bad in England. And it was very, very seldom a job going. If there was, it was about two million people after it. Anyway, I got in the Navy and I signed up the 12 year. Never regret it. Of course, there's times you had a bit of a drip on. When you've been away for about uh, a couple of years, you think it's all water. About the time I got around with my own people. But of course, when you came home, you forgot all about that. You had a good time, had your wallop, you had everything you wanted. And then you'd say, uh, right, it's time I've got to move on. And uh, where well, you came back, volunteered for a ship, join a station preferred or something like that. Up you go again. I forget the next ship. Oh, uh, 
she was a big uh, submarine parent ship. I forget the name of her. But anyway, we we didn't go out in that. What did I go in? I forget it now. The old memory ain't what it used to be. But I'm very glad I had the experience when I went there. You get the kids used to come here. What's it like there, Uncle Jack? What's it like out there? You tell them, and they, they wouldn't believe you. And the curio that I bought home gave to me mother. I've still got some of them now. But my brother, he seemed to be very jealous of me. And I swear to Christ, he used to take these things out and give them away if I wasn't there. I do honestly believe that, you know. He used to jealous of everybody, Jack. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd, I'd only been in England for about three or four months. And I'd been away three years spending the money I was spending then, you see. Mm -hmm. When I was skinned, I'd volunteer to go away again. First draft out, no matter where it was. Mm -hmm. But invariably, I liked China because you stayed out there longer. And uh, I, I really enjoyed it. And then, then you finished your 12 years. And then what did you do after that? I finished my 12 years, then I came out. Uh, I got married. Came out, and uh, of course the kids were, were, wasn't all that good then. I went night work, and uh, oh, I'd done several jobs, but the pay wasn't good enough, I don't think. So anyway, I, I don't myself, oh, I'll go back in here. Oh, I got caught up again for the war. So uh, away we went. Of course, being old ship, you knew your ship. You had your reserve kit, you were the reserve kit. You took that down with you. Of course, went straight down into the drill shed. Uh, then the stroke the slack. Oh, I got the dizzy lights in. Uh, yes, what do you want? Uh, oh, you got all your kit and everything? Yeah. Well, over here, you. Well, they're smashing us on ships right away, you know. Out we went. I get the Blanche, HMS Blanche. War had just been declared. I don't, I don't know whether it was five days or seven days after war was declared. We was running around over patrol, I know. Come in, fuel an hour, fuel, load up, food an hour again. Out there for weeks at a time. I got, blimey, I got out there this time and cruising around there. And bang, up in the bloody air we went, magnetic mind. Blast on right off. Of course, there was a bit of panic to start off with, but there was no, really no fear. The blokes didn't show fear, I'll say that for them. All the lot of them. Except one bloke. And he was a big, tall, Kelly Stoker. I could think of his name if I could, or I'd tell you his name if I could, but I forget it. And he was ginger ear and everything he was. He was trying to help his bleeding life. Oh, oh, got to get in the water. He got in one of them Carly rafts, rubber rafts, you know, brown thing. And uh, he was the only one in it. <laughs> we all got a toe. I think there was a, right near it, sure, because I say we'd be doing double patrol at the time. There might have been mines, if you hit one of them swimming, it was just too bad. But of course they weren't close in shore, were they? Anyway, we went there and of course everybody was crying out we wasn't doing too clever in the war, the boats were going over. So were the poor army blokes. And of course you had the job of escorting them across the lake while you were down there. So anyway, I volunteered for a ship. I used to volunteer for one and leave. I used to hate depot, the old depot. I hate that, no, I'm 
I had to get out. Anyway, what was the next ship now? I'm not going to find out. I never regret it. I had a very, very good time. Now, you said you went on Russian convoys? Oh, yes. Russian convoys, this war. Yes. Oh, well, I took me time, and went out, and I got called back again. You see, I was on the reserve. I went back, and uh, I was the first ES-246. If you were even number, you went up first. And I was mine, I know my official number. You always went by that in the service. Uh, I, and it finished up with a six, so of course I went up there and I finished up, what did I do there, I went on the... No, I came out, I came out after the war. I came out after the war and I'd done about five years on reserve. At the same time, I'd done about five years in the Navy. I didn't get paid by either of them with the lumber you should have had. But they said to me, if you care to go back for another three or four years, complete your 22 active service, really active service, you will get a full pension. So of course I ducked and dived again and I went again. And uh, I was only still having a Killing Stoker, three badge Killing Stoker. Mind you, a lot of times I've never had my badges, I lost them. But, uh, Why did you lose them? I'm getting boozed and that. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I used to go and have the booze and all that, you know. <laughs> they took them away, then? Eh? Oh, they took yeah. the hands yeah. away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I got settled down to it and I, I finished up as a three badge killick. Kill, three badge killick, and that's kill, what? Uh, killick Stoker. Oh, yeah. Just leading Stoker. I see, yeah. And uh, I don't regret it. I never regret it. I really enjoyed myself. Yes. Now, uh, what did you say your father? Your father done when you were a lad? Oh, he used to be an old handsome cab driver. He used to drive a handsome cab, yeah. Yeah, he used to drive a oh, handsome yeah. cab. Yeah. And uh, he was a good old boy, my old man. Yeah. Uh, one wouldn't he give us a good eye, mind you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he went about 16 stone. And if he threw your right hander, you knew you had it. But as a rule, he had his hand back in and used to wipe it. And that blood in here knocked our heads off, let alone anything else. And we were really tough. We were really tough. We come from Boysom Road, you know, as kids. Walworth, you said. Walworth. Walworth well, yeah. Boysom Road is in Walworth. Oh, yeah. And uh, we used to go out camping. Our holidays, we never knew what holiday was with our mother and father. That was something out of question. And if you were, got to uh, Boston Woods or something, or somewhere like that, you know, oh, that was bloody marvellous. You were in the country. You know what I mean? Yes. yes. But uh, I don't know. Uh, the old days, I suppose they could have been better. They could have been a lot worse, though. Yes. Couldn't they? Yeah. <laughs> I think that. Yeah. And then. Uh Yes. And then, uh, when, when would you come out of the Navy? Uh, in the 50s, I suppose? Oh, no, later than that. Later than that, was it? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I came out then and I went, uh, what did I do when I first got out there, Andrew? I wouldn't tell you about it, I could. Oh no, I, I decided. And I went back in the Navy again. Oh, yes. And uh, I went and got back. By going back for all about four or five years, I think it was, that completed me other ten on the top I'd already done, you see. So it made it 22 years. But the years between, War years was never counted. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I had to bloody do them like for nothing. Yes. I didn't bother them, it never bothered me as long as I got my old wages, I got my old pound of ticklers. And that, I, I, that's all I worried about.
and promotion didn't mean a thing to me because I see three parts of them that were made clicks and such like. They wouldn't have got a job as a second class stoker with us in my days. You know what I mean? Yeah. A bloke came aboard us, where was it? We just shut down, we shut down overnight. Peace time, right? We shut down overnight and this bloke, he knew everything. What were we? Well, piss off, you know. Yeah. And uh, he said, uh, so and so and so and so, uh, what's your seniority? I said, my seniority, who wants to know that? I do, he said, someone's got to take this mess over. We've got about 20 stokers, 20 or 30 stokers down there. And that wasn't all together, not unless you had a ransom, you know. But I said, uh, what do you want to know? He said, well, someone's got to... I had the 18 months or something. The old old granny's aunt. I've had the hook 18 months. I said, what, did you just join up then? <laughs> but it's not, cousin. So he said, uh, no, he said, how long you had yours? I said, when you were up and around your old man's ball bag. I did, honestly. I couldn't help it. I said, come here, you see, try and tell us what to do. I said, I've seen more ships go to the bottom than you've ever played and seen you. Oh, I called him everything. Because I never liked to talk about the war, even when I came home, as I say, I was on the first destroyer of the plant, I came home. And my wife says, uh, I met her, and she was heavy with my baby. She said, hello, Jack. How are you? I said, all right, all right, Flo. I said, how are you? So she said, uh, what was it? You done half... You done half look ropey. Something she said like that to me. I can't think of what she said to me. Something, something endearment, you know. But well, I said, uh, my big mind again, really going. Well, I'm Donald McLean. I've been in agriculture all my life, um, preferably livestock. Uh, that was my main interest. I suppose it goes back in the uh, well, back breeding that um, great grandfather came down from Scotland, and another uh, grandfather um, who my roots go to again on my mother's side came from uh, Ockenden in Essex. Uh, he came to went to London in the hay and straw trade when the horses um, ruled the roost and of course um, by going as a young lad up to London and could see a potential he was on the original side of um, will hire as it is today where you're hiring a vehicle. In his day, he had uh, uh, a great stable of horses, and of course, um, they were um, loaned out to various people for various jobs. And it's rather strange, really, that my wife Helen here, um, her ancestors again uh, come from Essex, so we've both got a tie um, to Essex as well 
as to Kent, where we came from, um, at Bexley, uh, where we met and went to school. So it's it's very strange that we've got both got ties on this side of the river. Go on. Well, I'm Helen. My ties with agriculture are I went into the land army. I suppose really it goes further back than that. I come from Kent, and all my father's ancestors were Kentish. My mother from Sussex, and country people. My father, my great grandfather, came from Halstead in Essex, and I think he was a, a workhouse master in the 1800s. And then they, they were the family Newman and Clark. They were the Newmans, and they have a corn business. I think it's still going in Halstead. Um, as I said, I was in the Land Army. I always wanted to to uh, be part of agriculture. I loved horses and everything to do with the land. And then I met Don, and been part of the land and animals ever since, in a back seat sort of way. I suppose I've sort of been a backing for Don. I helped him, I hope. Have I helped you? Very much so. <laughs> <coughs> they always say, I mean, they always did say, well, uh, uh, you you can't, you've got to have someone behind you, even if it's growing chrysanthemums, you've got to have someone behind you who's, who's going to carry you and lift you, because you can't daughter. do it all yourself. Well, again, I've been in pedigree pigs most of my life, and also been in Jerseys and Guernseys. But um, I was born on the 12th of October, 1919, so I was a war baby from the First World War. And my father was in the uh, artillery, in the garrison artillery. So I was grew up with um, the backing of the First World War behind me and listening to him at different times. <coughs> was taken out to Belgium and France and Holland before, between the wars in the 30s, to see the old battlefields and what they were. So, I mean, when 39 war came along, I knew a little bit um, what perhaps to, uh, to expect. So, from then, um, I had the con conscription started, so... Um, being with the pedigree livestock, um, I had a crush for going into the cavalry, which I'm afraid I didn't realise what hard work that would have been. Anyway, I volunteered with household cavalry, but was rejected for being a half inch too short. I was five foot nine and a half, and you had to be five foot ten. Um, so that put the tin hat on that one, but uh, I was advised by my father not to join any of the uh, foot guards, he said they'll break your blinking heart. So then I waited, and then volunteered um, for the uh, joined up. I volu volunteered um, then for the Royal Scots Greys, uh, Household Cavalry of Scotland, and went and did all my cavalry training um, in Edinburgh. Um, and that was um, 1940. Well, I came out of the army in 1948, yeah, spring 48, wasn't it? Um, and I'd finished up a round peg and a round hole at the Rhine Army School of Agriculture at Ostinghausen in Westphalia, um, which, um, you know, it was a great achievement. Dairy to, instructor. Yes, uh, chief dairy instructor. And it was... It was something out of this world which you would never have thought. And it was at that time when I met Helen, um, and I'd still got 12 months to go in Germany, hadn't I? Yes. i still got 12 months to go in Germany when, uh, when we were married. And um, I came home in the that bad winter of... Um, February, February 48. 48 sort of thing. So, uh, and then, well, 
Then we went straight to Bewhurst. That's right. We went down to C.D. Notley's with pedigree jerseys at Bewhurst uh, in Surrey. Because you were Denning before you joined up. That's right. Well, John Denning was head man. He was head man and I was second man at um, Eric Boston's at Wilcott Grange, um, just outside Whitney in Oxfordshire. And uh, in those days, of course, um, head man in pedigree, pedigree cattle job, um, he earned a few shillings more. His money was um, five pound a week. Um, and I was second man and I was on two pound, two pound ten shillings a week. Uh, that was our, that was my wage when war broke out. But at that time, I bought a, a brand new Royal Enfield motorbike. So um, things were beginning to look up. But uh, when war came along, I mean, all I'd got was a brand new suit and a brand new motorbike, and uh, that was my lot. So um, you, of course, were still at uh, still at school at the outbreak of war, weren't you? Yes. <laughs> look in the camera then. Um, so you've got a daughter? Carrying on with what you've, you've got a daughter? Yes. Daughter? Oh, yes. You um, must have. Well, our daughter's uh, married to a farmer, farmer's son, and um, carrying on the tradition. And I think our grandson, who's now three, he lives farming. I think he will follow. Seems to be in the blood. So I think um, we'll always have this love of the country. We just hope the country still exists when Justin grows up. Not being uh, completely spoiled. Just wonder. Things aren't what they were when we started um, after the war. Well, we've seen... Life has changed tremendously. There's been, in this last in this last 20, 25 years, as regards the livestock, I mean, it's just been uh, revolutionized. I mean, you know more if you've got a herd of which was about 60 cows, which is a big herd, and you knew every one by name and so forth. Um, you've got two and 300 head of cattle in some of these herds, and I mean, they're only got over then. They're not managed. I mean, they are really factoryized, and the same with pigs today. I mean, when I was here in Long Melford with Stafford Allens, we had no more than 75 sows, and you knew every one, and all the progeny from them, all the daughters, which were, of course, earmarked at eight weeks old, and uh, you've got a, a record of the progeny, of the year number, uh, and you their pedigrees bared looking into more than some of ours. And it was... It was um, a great thrill to be able to say, oh, well, I remember that that guilt's grandmother, she was so-and-so, and she reared so many pigs. Because, I mean, they were the records that you had, and they were the things. The, and that's how you improved your stock. What I'm afraid now, with this um, hybridization, um, though I should say it, the gain has stemmed from America, and we, like a lot of mugs in this country, have followed it on, uh, everything's a blinking hybrid, so, and um, I mean they're all mongrels. You've got well, no gone, idea. Yeah. There's no quality. There's no taste. There's nothing at all <coughs> in the actual pig today, and what we knew it. She came to Stafford in 1950, wasn't it? Yes, we came to Kangaroo Melford. That's right, in 1950, and uh, I suppose, really speaking, that. Uh, Stafford Allens in those days. Um, funny enough, we, we straddled uh, the uh, Essex and Suffolk border because we had land in Essex and land in Suffolk, which was very handy. Uh, any times when there was any troubles, we could switch stock from one county to another and be within within the law. And um, we, we were able uh, to keep ourselves going and to keep to keep selling livestock, um, where other people perhaps up in Suffolk here were, were closed right up. So living on the Norfolk-Suffolk border was a great asset to us. 
Um, uh, Essex. 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 What did I say? <laughs> Norfolk. <laughs> uh, I beg your pardon. Essex. Essex, Essex Suffolk border. But um, the um, the herd was recognised as one of the tip top in the country with successes successes at um, uh, Olympia, the Dairy Show, and at Earl's Court, Smithfield, and at the Royal Show, <coughs> and all county shows. We. So you were in Essex before we came here, weren't you? For yes. Two years. Yes. Prior to that, of course, we lived at um, Diddlebury uh, near South and Ward with Essex Peaks. Uh, what I'm afraid they've gone. Um, they have fastly disappeared now to what they used to be, and that was. Um, that was a great after the war, of course. The Essex pig was, uh, well, one of the foremost pigs in the country. And um, people, again, they've, they've let them go, they've let them slip, they've virtually let them disappear. They were good mothers, good milkers, and a, a very ideal farmer's pig. But um, as I say, this last 25 years, we've seen, seen a lot of changes uh, into agriculture <coughs> and again with all these sprays and things like that which um, again we don't hold with I mean I mean, think in your land army days you you were using um, yes I suffered with the uh, um, nicotine poisoning we, there was no restraint uh, very casual use of uh, the basic sprays, there weren't so many used, but uh, we used some nicotine dust and I inhaled that. But uh, there's nothing like the sprays that you use now. And of course, the fertilizer was all dung, natural dung. Well, it's only, as, as you say, fertilizer, which, which is not natural. I mean, whereas you kept your livestock on your farms, nearly every farm was a mixed farm with about 30 cows and about 60 or 70 breeding ewes and a dozen or so sows. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> you had a amount, certain amount of muck and um, your muck was your main fertilizer. Uh, it wasn't like all these chemicals on there today that you've got to be push, push, push more fertilizer every year to get bigger and better crops because the, the, your soil uh, there's nothing left in your soil. It, your artificial fertilizers wash through every year. You've got to keep replenishing. When you had a good old heaps of muck out there, it did put some some body into the soil, which in a lot of farms, I mean, could certainly deal with today. But 20, this last, to say, 20 or 30 years, the whole idea of agriculture had been uh, revolutionised which, to my way of thinking, um, isn't for the better. Other people might have different ideas. All right. OK. Well, you, you, looking back, your real introduction to shows was when you were about eight, at first set, when you went to first set. No, well, Auntie, when Auntie, um, my aunt, took you. my aunt took me up to Thurso for um, a holiday. But she had apparently been up there in the First World War, she Little was working. Friend, she? She's working up there. And, yeah. and um, whilst I was there, the um, he was a sort of a quaint person. The uh, the the local milkman um, always wore his kilt, and, and um, his uh, yeah, and his oh now what's the name of his hat? Um, Glen Gary? No, not Glen Gary. The Tamishandra. Tamishandra. He always wore his Tamishandra and his kilt and sparring and that. And because I, with his, he came round with his car and the milk churns in the back. I soon got hitched onto him, and um, used to go back to the farm with him after he'd done his milk round in Thurso. And it was whilst I was there that I had the opportunity. Now whether it was the Caithness show, <coughs> I'm not certain, but he was out of. Thurso, that I went to the first agricultural show that I ever went to, and I was, as I say, I was uh, eight years old, and uh, my aunt always says that there was a, a Berkshire sow laid in the pen uh, with a red card above it, 
and uh, I virtually stood by that peak nearly all day. So whether uh, that was my first introduction uh, to an agricultural show, well, I suppose it was. But as a very small boy, um, I was taken to um, our local uh, butcher had a small holding in Kent and he had everything running about there and I couldn't have been above well, about just his age I suppose That's before I went to school I was taken down there one afternoon I sat in the shop basket of the, of the trade bike and I went down all the afternoon and I suppose these were my first uh, introductions um, to livestock which uh, grew on me and going back to what I said just now about agricultural shows, um, showing has been my um, life. Uh, we've never made a fortune, far from it. Uh, but I've thoroughly enjoyed myself. Now whether uh, this is where my wife has had to bear with me, uh, it hasn't been much of a life uh, for her being left at home because uh, some weeks when we were with Stafford Allen's in particular, uh, we were doing two shows a week. Um, perhaps I'd come home from um, the three counties of Malvern and I'd be off on the Saturday um, to um, Huntingdon or, the, or, or to uh, the Essex show. And <coughs> it was those things that you had to have an understanding wife. And, and that was the point because as soon as you came home, the change of clothes, a bath, your basket packed with your food for the next three or four days sort of thing. And from February, I suppose, we used to start at Bedford Show and Sale. We started off at Bedford and uh, we carried on virtually through the months. That was about, yes, yeah, so the end of February. We carried on then through the months until we perhaps finished up at Cambridge Fat Stock Show on the uh, second week in December. Well, in the meantime, uh, we'd been uh, to the virtually uh, to Norfolk, Suffolk and Essex, um, down to Kent, Tunbridge Wells, uh, Royal Counties, Sussex, uh, Bath and West, three counties. Um, we went up to the Great Yorkshire at one time. Um, and as perhaps we went to Hadley. Uh, and we always had to do the South Suffolk because Mr. Gooding, the um, farm manager, <coughs> was on the committee and we were expected to go there. Um, that was the early part of the year, so we thought that was a, a try for what we got. Um, I had been sometimes to the Oxfordshire show the week prior to the South Suffolk show. But um, showing was our bread and butter. I took uh, I took a wage at Stafford Allen's. I also took half the prize money. I also uh, had a percentage um, on the sales of the um, pedigree stock that was sold. And our showing was virtually um, our uh, advertisement. Um, we did work out once, Mr. Gooding reckoned, that our 12 month showing was far cheaper than having an advert on the front page of the Farmer and Stock Breeder for one week. So that just goes to show what it was, and that was two of us and a lorry would go off and do majority of the shows. And I mean, for the amount of pigs that we sold, and the amount of pigs that we exported, uh, we used to sell over 200 breeding boars a year. Um, when, if you think, that a bacon pig in those days was 22 pound and you could get uh, 45, 50 guineas for a boar virtually the same age. I mean, that's where the profit was in pedigree pig keep. But I'm afraid now that um, those days are behind us. But now I've finished uh, practical um, livestock. Now I'm retired. I've been... Um, honoured by the Dexter Cattle Society and the British White <coughs> excuse me <coughs> British White Cattle Society and also the Murray Greys 
that they've put me on their judges lists. Do you um, judge pigs? I had, I had been on the National Pig Breeders Association panel from about 1958 until 1988, which I've come off the um, National Pig Breeders Association panel, but I'll still judge pigs that are um, not under MPBA records, and especially fat stock shows and so forth. The reason you've come off is because their new policy that you must be a breeder. Well, that's right. The, uh, the, you've got to be a breeder. You've got to have so many litters registered a year in the MPBA. And so, I mean, that for the likes of me, that, that cut me out. So I withdrew from the MPBA, and I've taken up more on the cattle side, um, which, again, is just as much interested enthusiasm for me after being... Um, I don't know if I said that when I was in Germany, I finished up <coughs> as um, chief dairy instructor at the Rhine Army School of Agriculture, um, and cattle have always been uh, just as dear to my heart as what uh, pigs ever were. <coughs> Going back, um, to I think it was in '56. <coughs> I went to the uh, dairy show for Stafford Allen's and I had um, <coughs> cut me out with them. Going back to what I was saying just now, um, my love for cattle and for pigs, um, I went to um, Olympia for Stafford Allen's in 1958, um, I took three pigs, I should have taken four, um, I had to find two pairs of bait pigs, but I couldn't find two pairs, I could find one extremely good pair and one extremely good single pig. So we four went the um, entry fee on the pair and took the single. Any road, we took the pair of sing we took the pair of baiting pigs out um, into the ring, and they behaved. Well, I don't think, though I say it myself, I don't think anybody had seen a pair of pigs behave as well as what did. They followed me right round the ring. I had an apple in each hand, and they performed. Um, it's in the records um, that they that they'd been sort of. Um, circus trained pigs. Any road, I won with that pair of pigs as a pair. Um, I came into the next classification under Colonel Portsmouth um, and I brought, then I had to bring out this other single pig that I took up there, which should have been in the previous pair. Any road, that was such an outstanding pig on its own. That one and one of the other pair that had one as a pair came second and um, I finished up with those three pigs with uh, two firsts and a second prize but then I went on to take those pigs out uh, into the championship um, for the uh, champion pair of pigs in the show um, and of course <coughs> they again performed excellent uh, they paraded round the land race pigs that were I was up against in there. They took one look at the big open ring and the sawdust and woof woof, and away they went, one in each corner of the ring. Um, my little pair walked round there really excellent, and Tom Copas, who was judging the Supreme Champions, had no hesitation in putting me up into the corner. Uh, when we came out again for the... Um, single pig championship um, I again took the champion single pig um, much to my surprise and that was my day well in the evening um, was the stockman's competition and um, Lady Luck sat on my shoulder because the Sandringham trophy was put up um, for the first time and um, that was to um, judge cattle 
and uh, pegs and um, I finished up um, with um, 100 out of 100, I don't know if it was ever done since, um, that um, I took the Sandrion trophy um, for myself. So I finished up with um, two, uh, two cups for Stafford Allen and a cup for myself, which was the Herdsman's Cup. So on the strength of that, and my strength of being with Jerseys and Guernseys in my younger days, I was very honoured to be asked then to go onto these various panels on the, their judges' lists. Um, again, now that I've retired, I can take it a little more casual because I'm now uh, Chief Livestock Steward at the South Suffolk Show, which um, has grown uh, from strength to strength. Um, we have an excellent team um, on the on the livestock side, um, which is uh, David Jackson is uh, chief cattle steward. Uh, Jack Smith is uh, chief uh, pig steward, and Tom. Um, Tom's name. Anyway, we've got an excellent sheep steward. Bridges. Bridges, Tom Bridges, excellent sheep steward. So with the uh, four of us, uh, we've made up an, an excellent team for the South Suffolk Show. Um, last year was the centenary. Uh, we had, well, we've never seen so many cattle and sheep there sort of thing. Poor old pigs were down a bit to what they used to be years ago. But nevertheless, it was really uh, an outstanding show for the... South Suffolk and it's um, all due to the perseverance of the stewards who help make it. There's a lot of uh, labour goes into it which I mean um, it's all free labour and um, we do it, it's a matter of love and we all do it and we all thoroughly enjoy it and uh, this year uh, we'll, it was the 100th show last year and this will be the 101st this year. So, um, really speaking, we've got uh, a lot uh, in front of us this year because we've just lost our secretary, unfortunately. We lost him at Christmas, so we're having to carry on with the threads and uh, hope that his son, who's carrying on, can uh, pick up and make the show this year uh, another success for us. The main thing I suppose uh, with all of us uh, tucked into um, livestock uh, in this particular area that there's not vast fortunes made out of it today again it's the love love of animals and the love of livestock and going into these rare breeds like the uh, Dexters and um, British Whites uh, Murray Greys and uh, even into the, the minor pig breed sort of thing um, these people enjoy their stock and this is the main the main thing that they're not going to as I say make a fortune out of them that they're doing a worthy job and keeping those animals uh, ticking over and they're keeping their breeding right and for one day they're going to come up trumps again as regards these blasted hybrids which are nothing at all uh, when you finish with them sort of thing. So I don't know if I've got a lot more to say whether... Uh, have you got any more to say, my dear? Yeah, yeah, but uh, it's one of those things that I've thoroughly enjoyed my, my life in agriculture. Uh, if I had it over again I wouldn't do any different. Um, I suppose these people who jump from pillar to post uh, have never been any more satisfied than what I was. It was seven days a week and all I had to do was to walk uh, to the end of the garden path and I was at work. I didn't have to jump in a car, uh, go to the station and commute uh, to some far off place uh, six, seven days a week. That wouldn't please me at all. I was very happy uh, with what I did. 
I got great satisfaction out of it, even if I did get up at two and three in the morning and put my Wellingtons and dressing gown on and slip down the yard to see if there was a sow powering or what she was doing, if she was any trouble or what have you. Those are the sort of things that you did automatically. And um, either you liked it or you didn't like it. And you soon weeded out the wheat from the chaff. Those sort of chaps that came into it, they didn't last long. They weren't the stayers. And um, I'll take my hat off to any stockman, to any showman that he lived for his animals. But on the other hand, <coughs> he didn't always get a good straight deal when he'd given his life to his stock because if, if the uh, boss died or something happened, the whole herd was sold uh, round his neck and he was left high and dry. So, I mean, he wasn't... He wasn't in a 100% safe sort of job. It was still a risk, but it's one of those risks that you take on and you... This is Jack Cook, who lives at Red Cottages on the 1st of May, 1989. I was born in Long Mountain in Southgate Street. Yeah. And we moved to Fox Earth for the second time and lived in Cook's Cottage. You, what year was you born? 1905. 1905, yeah. Have you lived in Cook's Cottage for the second time, yeah? My father was the driver for Mr. Warden, David Warden Sons. That was Teddy Cook, wasn't it? Yeah. His name was Teddy Cook and he and he uh, So I suppose he was a dry, he was a drayman. Yeah. I suppose he delivered how far did he deliver the horses? Huh? How far did he deliver? How far out would he go? Oh Hedigham and Bios and Winefield and all around oh, yeah. places at that. What did he have them and all like, okay. yeah. Two horse drain, was it? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah, carry on. You won a turkey, you said one day. One day on his rounds he won a turkey. And he took it across to the village club and rattled it all again. So you didn't have a turkey? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yes. And you left school? I left school in 1919, Oxford School in 1919. And I went to Brook Hall as a baghouse boy for the late Mrs. Brand. That's Julia. Mother, mother of uh, J.P. Brand. Yes, that was Julia Brand. Now there's no tractors, you say? There was no tractors or cars. And there was 20 horses kept and worked for the land. And, uh, and then you, you worked in the garden until until the last three years of your yeah. working life. Yeah. And I worked in the garden till the last three years. And then I went to the brewery to Drayman on Sharon's lorries. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, what about Brook Hall, Jack? What can you remember about Brook Hall? How many people were there in the household, in the brand's household, when you went to work there? There was, uh... That's Mrs. Brand, I suppose? Ms. Mrs. Julia, Julia Brand. Julia Brand, yeah. And Miss Ethel Brand, her daughter. Her daughter, oh, yeah. And, uh, a housemaid. And a cook. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, the coach road, Jack, you tell me it's called the coach road because the coach used to go up and down there, didn't it? All, yeah. They always went that way. They didn't come up this way towards Fox, they always went down that way, didn't they? Well, mostly. Mostly, yeah. 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 And uh, you say they used to have to sweep the road every Saturday morning? Yeah. The coach road was cleaned and swept, ready for the coaches to go to church. 
on a Sunday morning. Yes. And uh, what was it? One horse coach or two yeah. horses? But one horse coach. Yeah. And what was it? A, 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 what do you call it? What what sort of coach did you call it? A brougham, did you say? A broom. A broom. Oh, one was a broom. Yeah. And then the other one would be what? A cab. Just a cab thing. Yeah. yeah? One horse, was it? Hey? Yes. And whose coachman did you say? You sort of chap's name? Rolf. Rolf, yeah. He lived next door to me up yeah. here for a cottage. Yeah. 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 And uh, you didn't know old Thomas Brandon? No, I didn't know him. He died before you came, yes. to, came to work here, yeah, yeah. Now, um, the football club, Jack, do you remember the football club being formed after the war? Yes, I remember the football club then started again after the war. Yeah. And I knew several of the players who came back. Yes. Joe Oakley was the captain, and Fred Shinry, and uh, Fred, yeah. Fred Shinry, yeah. Tom Alwyn. Oh yes, that'd be quite a lot. Yeah. Now, uh, now you said old uh, Archie Lambert. He used to play football, didn't he? Oh, no. Paddy? Paddy? Yes. Yeah. Oh, he was Archie, wasn't he? I was Archie. Yes, yes. Yeah. He played football in all, didn't he? Well, I was just in a friendly. Oh, sort of friendly, yeah. He didn't play regular. No, I oh, know. He just played for... And he was in... playing a land and brewer, and he used to play for the land. Oh, they used to do this. What was this? Uh, just a... Bank holidays or something. Yeah. Yeah. And who the... Who... He was a right back or something, did you tell me? Yes, he played back with me, with uh, the Brackley was then Mr. Carbner or Reverend Carbner. Oh yeah, yeah. And what uh, what did you say? He used to say, "Oh, Paddy Lambert used to say." <laughs> you played a man, and I played a ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the way. Yeah. Uh, now, when when did you get married, Jack? What did 1935. You yes, and you've got one daughter. Yeah. Yeah. And two great grandchildren. Two great grandchildren. Yeah. All right. I was born in 1904 in Foxer. I had four brothers and two sisters. In 1914, the first war. World War broke out. My two elder brothers volunteered for the army at once, and another man was on reserve from the farm and had to go. In May 1918, Millie and Jack Newman were taken from school to work on the land. I went to Foxer Hall, and Jack went to Brook Hall. The wage per week was six shillings. They are now called five peas. We worked long hours until 6.45 at night. I married at the age of 27. By then, the wage on the land, when you reached the age of 21, was 28 shillings per week. But Mr. Lambert, who farmed Foxer Hall, gave the men an extra shilling per week. The crops were much lighter than they are today. I remember one summer there was a drought and the harvest was got in in three weeks. Things began to brighten up by 1935. Then the Second World War broke out in 1939, but not many were called up from the land. The Home Guard were formed, and I had to join Long Melford. I worked for Mr. ABC Campbell Lambert until 1948. That was 30 years. He then handed the farm over to his son, J. 
J.B. Campbell Lambert, but he only farmed it for five years. He then led it to a yeoman farmer named Chapman and went to Shropshire, where the Lamberts had an estate of 500 acres. My father was too ill to work in 1947, so I took his place in the garden, which I liked very well. But after nine years, I left, as Chapman would take me out of the garden onto the farm, and the garden went behind. I went to work at a plastics factory at Glimpson for three years and then back to gardening at a factory called BBA, which had flowers and shrubs around every building. I was there for three years. Then I was ill and did not do any more work. I was 64. Every, every, going back to old days, every village had a football team. I played it outside left. And one year, one year, every player scored a goal. Even my young brother, who was a goalkeeper, scored from penalty spot. When my mother died, there were three of us boys and my father. Therefore, my sister, who was working in London, had to come home to keep house for us, as there was us three boys and father. We had some gay old times. Ready? Yes. We had some very gay times in, in the evening. My father used to go to the club and play cards with the men. And us boys formed a small band. I played the accordion. Ernest played the tin whistle. And Bernard had a tin tray and a poker used as a drum. We did make a noise, I can tell you. The nurse lived over the other side of the street and she used to say, that's a crazy man squirrels again. One night father did not want to go to, to the club. He wanted to read a, a book, but we wanted to play the band. So Bernard, who was the oldest and strongest, pulled him out of his chair and said, get his jagger, and we put it on him and pushed him out of the door. He took it all in good part as a joke. I can see him now going down the path and laughing. He had a bit of fun himself when he got to the club. He was playing solo whist and he had a, a full hand and he did not show it. He played it out backwards and the men grumbled and called him everything up. But he had his laugh. Right. What a lot of difference now to what there was when I was about 19. Every village had a football team. Fox Earth, Bawley, Panther. There were always plenty of kids about. But I remember our team went to Boxford on the, on the way to Ipswich. We changed that Boxford fleece, the public house, and then went across after the match was over to another public house called the White Horse and, and bought a beer. I thought that was a very dirty trick. A big, a big mistake was made when the Second War broke out. 
the fire tender was sent to Fox Earth, a small village like that, and stored at the brewery. Every Sunday morning, there was me and several more, and Ward lent us his small lorry. And of course, old Vickens said, well, we must have some cases to sit on, sir. So we had cases to sit on, but some of them had got some beer in. So we had a jolly good time on a Sunday morning. And I remember going to, to, to Bulma, uh, Golden Hall, I think it was called. And there was a family there that had come right down from Scotland and they lived there. But they, I, I don't know how long they were there, but they came from there to Brook Hall. And I'm, spe I'm speaking to the very man now. Uh, but sometimes we have rather too much beer, I can tell you. <laughs> but, uh, When I went to work in the Foxes Hall garden, Mrs. Lambert was the boss of the garden, and she was a lovely person to, to work for. And uh, we had flower shows in Fox Earth. There was the amateur side and the professional side. Well, I used to grow stuff in Foxes Hall for the professional cup and uh, also grow plenty of stuff in the arm garden for myself. And two or three times I won both cups, both the professional one and the amateur one. But people got rather, rather annoyed and jealous, I think. And so at the finish, I, I, uh, I fell out uh, showing myself, but uh, I used to show for Mrs. Lambert and, until until the whole show packed up. I think it was for want of money, but. They used to have a, a beer tent down there. I remember old Vic Inch being in charge of it, and and, and, and Billy something. That was on the cricket meadow. Wasn't it? That was on the cricket field. But I, I can tell you there was there's some jolly good stuff there, and and, and sometimes things went pretty. Close to me, winning or losing. I can't remember. Mm. All right, Tom. Uh, my name is Tom Hooksbury. Uh, Tommy Hooksbury, they call me nowadays. I farm at Belson Walter Place called well, Clark Farm. I originate from Denmark, and uh, well, before I say too much, I will just enlighten a bit of my upbringing. I, <coughs> I come from a small farm in Denmark, my father farmed 80 acres, and uh, it was some of the poorest land in the country. Some was head and moors, in fact, they, some of which were partly ploughed up, but we, we, well, we were a very, very poor family, but the only thing about that, everybody was poor, it didn't matter so much. And uh, we had a most Spartan upbringing, we lived 80 percent off the farm, which we might come down to yet, but sort of, you know, it off the farm more or less. And, and we even dug our own fuel for the winter in the time. We had a dairy herd of 12 cows, which was quite a medium farm out there these days, and uh, follows plus 6,000, four horses and number of pigs, etc., etc., and poultry. 
there's a, but that's one thing in those days, there's a quite a happy, quite a happy time on the farm because everybody was the same and there was a lot of, of um, children on the farm and many farms, you know, not like these big farms now where you can't see all the, you can't see all the, the boss in the, uh, once in a while, you see farms were much more social these days and they of course mixed up well with each other. They, uh, there's one thing they all had in common, had plenty of children and uh, and so that creates a, a good good life for the farmer community in general. We didn't start going to school before I was seven, but somehow I managed to get something into my head. Uh, and uh, we left school when I was 17. And after that, I went to agricultural college and also youth school, which took about two, two various, uh, two months, always in the winter months we had to do that. After that, somehow I've been out working on a farm every other year. My father, he was, had one of my son, my father was home on me. We had to go in out on the farm and earn a living, and every other year we were home and worked for nothing for my father. That wasn't very good. But anyway, cutting a long story short, I went to agricultural college, as I told you before, and uh, the friend of mine there had. Been to England, he thought I had a nice time he'd had, so I was about 23 at the time, and I am um, 24, I forget now. <laughs> and uh, I came over here, I took a, bought a ticket from Hyatt to 29 of February, or 20, yeah, that was, that was about February, so of course it's a, it's a leap year day, or whatever it is. I came here the first of, First of March in England, Lenton Harris, it was a very stormy night and that was not very good. But anyway, came here with half a crown in my pocket and I started working on the farm as a cowman. That, uh, that went very well. I milked all the cows. I was an elderly cowman, he was nearly 70, and I had to do all the milk and he took all the money. However, cut a long story short, I, uh, after I'd been with him about I had to be about six months of war work out, so I got a certain model. I didn't know if I ought to go home or not, or shall I stop? And they weren't too clever to cross the North Sea these days with all the war going on, so I sort of couldn't make up my mind. Eventually, I stopped there. And uh, come spring, and uh, then we'll forget into the war, it got worse than ever. So uh, I certainly decided to stop in England for good. and. Uh, but I wasn't getting a lot of money down there. I only had a pound a week of my food, and that wasn't a lot of money even these days. So I gave him notices. I found myself a job in East Suffolk, and there I uh, had a farm that's we not far from the coast. And the told as soon to go out there, I got chased out again because they didn't want the foreigners so near the coast. So I went into Huntington near Barry another job, chopping sugar beet out, stuff like that. I, I was slightly better off, but anyway, there were all the sort of people on the farm these days. I got a job. Not now like they said, did at least have people on the farm these days. They haven't got much there now. But anyway, however, I came to a man, Mr. Bell. He was um, an extraordinary chap. He was, his father was a, a big noise from the city. He didn't have much idea about farm, but he had about 800 acres there. And he kind of took to me and he said, um, he sort of put me in charge of the farm and everything else. I could hardly speak the language. The another thing when you immigrate, this language is a much bigger problem than people think sometimes. You're not only got to get into the language, the culture, the business, but it's quite a sweat. Mm -hmm. However, I, I mastered the language somewhat and um, well, after about 12, 14 months and I've been in England. And uh, then one day he said to me, I think, uh, Paul, I think I shall go to the war. Oh, said, you can worry about me. You know? and I, well, you don't need to go to the war. You're the better farmer of us too, he said. So, well, that's hard and nice to know. However, so he went into the war, and uh, he got in the coastal command. He was stationed, lower stuff that way. He was a jolly nice fellow, but anyways, being war, what it is, he trusted me to all his land, and he gave him a power of attorney, and, Everything else I came home fairly regular and uh, 
we did the rounds in the very hostelries and other things and so that people did during the war when the pubs were open. Anyway, kind of long story short, then he went to America after that and so he gave me power of attorney for the whole and I could do what I like with all his pubs and coming home one day he said we've got to Lincoln see and buy some more land. So we bought some more land in Lincoln see and hired a lot more. So I, had, I landed up doing the war with farming just about 2,000 acres in one lot. And uh, it was not all that clever these days for labour, as if people well know anyone lived that long time. But I, we did manage somehow, but I can assure you I didn't have a, I didn't have a holiday for six years, not one day. The only day I had off when I got married, that was from bank holiday. Monday, 1941, I married a girl from Oxford, that's where we came first. So anyway, with a lot of sweat and all that sort of war went on and we had quite a lot of damage done to the property, stuff up the war was certain. I went to London, I was the only one that drove a lawyer to London in the Blitz, but I did that, I, had no, I learned to drive the hard way, you might say. I never passed a driver's license, but anyway. <laughs> So I went in and um, and all went well and it although war was a grim time, it was, of course it was a very, very interesting time and, and everybody it was a fantastic spirit among people who was whoever the English or whoever they were called any of the foreigners, anyone who got sympathized with them. But uh, after that I when the war sort of finished uh, they, they just about the, uh, when it finished my boss, he came out of the armies and uh, he said to me, I don't know where is who, I don't know, I think I shall, uh, I want to emigrate. Oh dear, he said, oh, so he's that all sort of paper and so he tried to emigrate to Australia. Well, he, that mean, meant selling everything up and he had sold his landing links. We had a little bit, I went to a friend of mine, myself, and he had the Rented about 700, no, 1800 acres of other people, but he, a whole lot, he let the whole lot go and he went to Australia. And uh, so, uh, and the farm I had, that was the only one he owned, he sold that. Cut a long story short, uh, so we had to look for a farm down here. So, okay. Well, after uh, all that hustle about my boss going to. <coughs> Australia and elsewhere, and I was sort of left to find a farm. I saw one advertised in, a, in East Anglian at the time, um, but for someone known there was only a, a, a box number, so I sent away for that and I got a reply back and said, such and such a farm to rent. So I come down here and I saw the agent, which is Lacey Scott from Berry. And he's good, he didn't know the farm was for let, but anyway, it's for let a little bit in the papers, you can take your turn. So I had to wait, advertise eventually, and they came in the papers, I came down here again and I had a chat with him, everything else. And eventually I met him once, and he had new market, at that time he ran the market, a new market, the old Lacey Scott, you know, he's dead now. But However, he was an extraordinary chap, he's really one of the old school, you know, and he was a I don't know, he was sort of very straight laced, but anyway, he somehow took to me and said, You come down there, I've got three of you picked out to look at the, for the final tenancy. So I got up to, to down here and missed myself one day and um, sat outside there. And a chap that came here, he was in here about half half an hour, and I said, Good Lord, I've got to see. And, uh, the next one came in, I was the last one in, a tree was sat in the room just in there, in those days, and uh, I was in there. When I came in there, I was only in there about five minutes, I said. <laughs> so I said, well, I'd better best go back to Lincoln see again, I don't stand much of a chance. But strangely enough, I got, he offered me the farm in the day or two after that. And later on, I asked him some while ago, why did he give me the farm? Ah, there were two things I liked about it, he didn't. You didn't tell me my job and talk too much, he said. I'm not saying you had good hard hands and a good solid hand strength, he said. Oh, well, that's something, thank you very much. So 
After that, I got the farm here. See, now his son, you know, John Lacey Scott, he's looking after the farm for, for Mr. Raymond down the road, he owns it. Luckily, they like a young farmer for well, for some unknown reason, Mr. Raymond. So they, I got on well with him and I got the farm. So I had sort of set about farming in my usual manner. We didn't have an awful lot of money, but I had plenty of, plenty of hope and charity and all that, so I got stuck into it. But looking back, these were very good farming years just after the war. And I sort of, you know, over the years I sort of expanded a bit. The first one I did up here, I bought the Coast Farm up next to uh, up the road here, that's a 110 acre farm. And I, I, well, I didn't go to the sale there, but I put a reserve on those days and that made 9,000 pounds. And I had a reserve of 9,200. No, I, I would have got a 9,200. I just, I just got it anyway, because I didn't go to sale. However, that last me a year or two. In the meantime, I expanded here a bit too, so I got one more tenant. On this farm, so I got 600 acres altogether. Then. And another chance after that, I made a bit of money. I always been a bit of a Invest, I wouldn't say speculate, invest a bit of money on the stock exchange when I had a bit of spare cash and some of that cash. I bought another farm at Pebmarsh, uh, Mr. Kelt these days, he was a local auctioneer. He was one of the old school too, I got on well with him, he said, oh, uh, Tommy they call me now, when I see in the room they always worth two thousand pounds from me, we're getting extra bidder, because I did bid on one or two farms. And when I bought the moat of Pep Bash, well, you can look back and say what a snip that was. But I was the best man in the day. I paid £27,000 for a big country house, one farmhouse and eight cottages and 400 acres. So that was a but today's time. That's a long while ago, mind you. Hundreds of farms in that. So after that, we got, uh, I had a manager over there a few years and I put a Eventually my son, the eldest son Peter took that over, so, so we were sort of still farming the family way and uh, all the time, but he's now got them. Um, there's one thing I, in, in my farm, I've never had any partnership with anybody, the only partnership I've got now my youngest son, and he'll take this farm over. He already take the tenancy over at the moment, the Clark farm. Don't forget, I've been here over 40 years. Then we had another farm come in the market over at Boxford, it was called Peyton Hall, that uh, 350 acres, that's a kind of organic farm, we've got a lot of cattle over there, and so that's sort of more or less completely there. So we now got the boys set up in a nice farm each, and uh, it's sort of all, it belongs to the family, it does, they all farm on their own, we don't, we don't live in any partnership or anything like that. They may have been some of the line after sisters and that sort of a different matter. <laughs> but anyway, that, that's a set up at the moment. Uh, it may sound a bit sort of a exuberant to a lot of people, and, uh, and but I see it, it's been a lot of hard, hard it's been a quite a hard slug over the years, and I've been quite lucky in a lot of ways from all that sort of But when I look back and the uh, I had so many good old people, my father and they were very old fashioned Victorian people, a lot of the small farmers say they, they've got the, the sense of integrity and stuff like that standing in good stead now. Um, I don't really know what else much I was going to say. Uh, we've got more or less established now that our farming pattern and I shall retire now that one of these days. And um, now you're president of the. Oh yes. So what did I? You just stop for a minute. Okay. Okay. I have over the years been uh, at certain the uh, um, posts at a parish council and been in the chairman in a few and uh, and chairman of South Suffolk Cult Association. Even last year, I was president of that, which is very nice to be asked. Uh, uh, to do these stuff and uh, sort of, uh, you know, contribute a little bit to the social environment of, 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 of the district. Otherwise, there's not a lot more to say. I mean, I, uh, <laughs> I'm getting over, I'm 74 now, so I shall soon retire from farming.
And there you are, so I think I can close with that remark. Yeah, I can't think what else. Well, I'm Richard Dates. I was born in Lemsford in 1931, about several years ago, and I spent most of my life in Glemsford. Um, went to school there, of course, uh, as did my parents and grandparents before me. Glemsford Board School. Uh, I left school at 14, doing my own apprenticeship for Harry Devon, the local builder, and an apprenticeship as a carpenter. Uh, I hadn't finished that, my apprenticeship that is, when I was called up to go in the army, do a national service in um, 1949, and that was just after the war. I'd done two years national service, spending most of that in Germany. Uh, I was on the Weser, um, Hamlin on the Weser, but most of the time was sort of the early part was in Dortmund on the Ruhr. And I suppose the rest of the time was the debt mould. They even learned a bit of German while I was there. Not very good, mind you. Um, come out of the army, resumed the trade as a carpenter for Harry Debner. Uh, wasn't long before he died. So I had to find another job. But, but before I'd done that, then I got married. Had to do a subject to find a wife. And I found uh, Dorothy Moulton here, and she was actually born in Essex. That's me. <laughs> born just over the river in Bournemouth, not far from where we are now. My ancestors all came from Foxer, Pentlow, lived in Cavendish, back to Foxer. And my dad ended up in Bournemouth, and we moved from Bournemouth to Sudbury, where we met Richard when we were about 16. Um, we married when we were 21. We have two sons, one 27 and one 37. Both marry, uh, both have two children each. The oldest ones are adopted children and they're all very happy, settling down lovely. We lived in Glemsford from the time we married until uh, six and a half months ago, which was 30, 37 years. The village of Glemsford got too big, too noisy, and we were lucky enough to find this bungalow here in Cavendish. And I think we should be very happy here. People are very pleasant. Uh, I think I'll hand you back to Richard now. Let's see, got some history to talk about. <coughs> well, I'd just like to go back to my two sons. I'd like to say that um, Gary, the oldest boy, is a uh, fairly successful education boy. Is he, um, Went to university, in fact, went to Guildford and got a second class honours degree there. And he's now a, a head teacher, a headmaster of a, of a village school, the primary school of Mellis. And he actually lives in Crescentville, which is a few miles further on. And Gregory, he worked locally, he worked at Sudbury, he worked for Willis, and uh, at a very young age of 26, he's been made. Uh, manager of the mill there, so he's in charge of milling all the timber, the, timber, the builders merchants in Sudbury. I suppose I'll go back myself, um, after Harry Devenham died and uh, the firm closed, I went to work for work Cambridge. I first worked for Sindels, which was a big contracting company, uh, done lots of big jobs, um, I was trying to think of the university, Clare I think it was, we was at Clare for a long time and also at um, Cherry Hinton Reservoir, a mass of concrete shut from there. And from there I moved on to Carriages, another big company in Cambridge, and done um, uh, big civil projects, I was involved again in concrete shutter and hardwood joinery, building a prudential building in um, uh, the main street in Cambridge, chemistry research laboratories in Lensville Road, for instance. Uh, carriages then went on to build Edinburgh's Hospital there. 
1954 or something like that, was it? I started me on my own, been self-employed, and I've been self-employed ever since. I'm trying to retire right now, and ain't terribly easy. Been had a pretty pretty good life really. Um, childhood was rough. I remember we had very little to eat, especially during the war. And used to have cardboard in my boots. I can remember quite clearly when the soles of war went through. Bloody great old studs in them. But apart from that, I ain't grumbling about it. As I said, I've been self-employed and uh, had loads of work. Never had to look for a job. I don't think I've been out of work no more than three weeks in 35 years. Is it 35 years? Mm -hmm. No more than three weeks in 35 years. I've still got tons of work, but although I'm trying to reduce my workload right now. Uh, I do spend a lot of time doing other things, mind you. I even mess about on the, on the guitar a little. But I suppose my hobby really is local history. I've had a great interest in that in the last um, almost 20 years, I suppose. I've done a number of broadcasts even. Been on a couple of films. Been on Down Your Way with Brian Johnson. Uh, been on a couple of Anglia films. I remember doing work for Geoffrey Clark, a sculptor at um, Harvest. And uh, Anglia, well, ITV used to film him every other week almost. And we had um, lots of work on Coventry Cathedral. And uh, I done work on there. Uh, involved in the moment of the high up, the cross over the high altar in silver, for instance. Done a great deal of work there. Had lots of interesting jobs. Uh, just recently been involved in a swimming pool at Monsealy for a farm there for Mary Stubley. Uh, got a prestigious award from the country landowners. I don't think I've had any other award. I diverse. Um, back to local history again. I've been involved in a in a in fairly widely too. When looking at it from the Suffolk point of view, and particularly the parish, uh, the parish of Glemsford, for instance, I've amassed uh, a great number of um, documents, original documents and copies. I've also um, collected a large number of photographs. I got at least 300 photographs of Glemsford, 300 along Melford as well. So I've been involved in not just the parish of Glemsford alone. And now we're here in Cavendish, we're going to have a look at Cavendish perhaps. We've got a, already got a Cavendish collection. Um, I'd like to show you a few of the publications that I've been involved in. Um, the first one I ever produced was uh, uh, this small booklet, which is called Glorious Glimpsford, and that was published in conjunction with the Silver Jubilee, yes. 1977, and there have been a number of reprints, at least, you can see here, at least three reprints, and I really don't know how many uh, copies have been sold couple of thousand at least, perhaps nearly three. And that's quite a simple booklet, just a, a collection of old photographs with a simple bit of text against them, and that's probably one of the most popular books that I've ever done. Um, the next one that I've done, which I think is probably uh, my finest work, was this one, The Map Maker and the Magistrate. Um, at least five years' work here in research, and that's based on the riot that occurred in Long Melford in 1885, when, after the widening of the Franchise Act, the uh, men from Glemsford Act and Stansted, etc., went down to Long Melford to vote. Uh, they went down in a body. My grandfather, my maternal grandfather, was a 15-year-old boy in the Glimpsford band that marched there that day. It wasn't long before there was a riot. There had been uh, a strike the year previous of all the 
local industries, mat making, hair workers and silk workers had all been on strike, went back for very low wage. So this election was a great opportunity to um, adjust things, put the world right, I suppose. They finished up with the 12th Regiment of Foot coming out from Bury. And by the way, this is Henry Cook, the leader of the, the Glemson Man. And he was actually sworn in as a, a constable, a special constable. That's a crazy thing to do. But he failed to get them all together, and there was a major riot. And the troops quelled a riot with the aid of the police, turning out the pubs, etc. But I do talk about 19th century industry in South West Suffolk. Uh, plus the cloth industry, etc., in this book. A great social story of South West Suffolk. Um, the next one I've done, again, has influence of, of Long Melford. I'm a member of the society down there, and I was chairman of the Melford Historical Society for a short time. Uh, that was just before I was ill, I was in the hospital and was seriously ill for a few months. They took me, keep me out. I'm still here. That magnificent Melford again is a, a collection of um, old photographs pertaining to Long Melford. Uh, there is the building of a school there in 1860, and again proved extremely popular. Um, sold quite well. Um, people like to see their own ancestors in old photographs and pictures in the printed form. Again, popular and been successful. Um, of course, my main interest is social history as these previous books um, show. But here uh, is something perhaps a little different. It was just a collection of uh, murders occurring in Suffolk. Loads of material for that. Again, a social story, you see. And what I did, I looked at about 48 different murders, mostly 19th century, with uh, the emphasis on about 18, and I wrote 18 up. And that's rather nice, you could actually find the, the sites of all these various murders, uh, tragic some of them. But that has, a, that has a social story, and that has a place in, in local history. Uh, part of our heritage of course and then again we've always been church people I mean as a as a boy I sung in Glensford choir so this is a publication I was got quite interested in was simply a guide to um, uh, Glensford church with illustrations done by Pat Flynn or done my son done the front cover my oldest son is quite artistic. So here we are producing a, a guide to the church with some very pleasant um, illustrations in it. And my last publication, well this is a by the way publication, this one is, but I have recently researched all those who were transported to Australia from Suffolk. And this little booklet is uh, an account of all 38 who were transported from Glemsford. So again, a, ni a nice social story, and um, I've been engaged with even some Australian correspondents. So we do know a great deal about them. Uh, one particularly I should like to mention is William Pearman, who was transported in 1841, and his direct descendant is still living in Glamsford, uh, 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 Mrs. Joan Tottenham, who was a Pearman, and she could tell a story uh, about him that her grandfather used to tell her, which was basically true. He went to Van Diemen's Land, he got 14 years transportation, and he came back a fairly rich man after 12 years. So they were fairly lenient with him. And he's buried in Glimpsey Churchyard, died in 1897, aged 85 years or something like that. But the big publication of these transportees is 
been promised to be published by the Suffolk Record Society, something like 2,000 different men and women, of course. There was women went as well, just one from Glemsford. There was about eight from Cavendish went, and even less from Mel Melford. But hopefully the, when that publication come out, uh, we'll put, again be a great social story and, of course, connected with family history. That brings us almost up to date, apart from this little bungalow that we moved into. As my wife said, we, we liked and lived in Glensford all those years with a certain amount of regret of leaving, but I'm afraid Glensford had been hijacked and raped and we further spoiled. So here we are in Cavendish and peaceful setting in a tiny bungalow where we have to spend our final days, where we've got a very pleasant garden. And I hope to do less physical work. Don't know whether I will or not. So that's probably about it. This is the Ravenous visit of Alfred Hicks, born March the twenty second, nineteen oh seven. Born in Ivy Cottage, Wickham Brook. I married an Ivy Foster. We were introduced, I'm told, in our prams. Ivy was the youngest of six, pretty sisters. She was the best. We went to school together. We were sweethearts, horror sometimes. Married in January the 2nd, 1932. We celebrated 50 years. Then after almost 52 years, Ivy died. We taught together in the Sunday school. She was organist at the 200 years old Congregational Church, now the United Reform Church. We were both on the Flower Show Committee. I was secretary for 48 years and am still assistant secretary. On the Flower Show Committee, um, we, went, we once went to a garden party at Buckingham Palace, an honour for me for public service, Eastern Sports Council, Suffolk Parish Council, etc., etc. Born to be interested in almost everything, I serve on football, Cricket, snooker, tennis, church, Haverhill District Sunday School Union committees, parish council for 36 years, local preacher 55 years, the Boys Brigade, I was a fa I'm a founder member, which we started in 1941, is still going strong. I still go to camp. I'm secretary of the Pearl, Pearl Insurance East Anglian District, pensioners, for 10 years. I was an agent 26 years. I spent most of my life as a salesman, grocer, milkman, clean, easy, etc. A football referee for 24 years, I sometimes wonder why. During all the time I have lived mainly in Wickenbrook except four years with Naffy at Milden Hall and Feltwell and then I came home cycling at weekends. Felt was, was 25 miles and, and, uh, and Newmark and Milden Hall was 15. We had Venturers at Feltwell and Lancaster's at Milden Hall. Incidentally at Australia's Rule, where they had Wellingtons, we had a young airman staying with us and his wife, newly married, lovely couple, and he was a pilot on a Wellington. He went over a few times, but one morning when I came down, his overcoat was not there, and I thought, ah, oh, I'm afraid he's gone. And he went down in Holland, and since then I've seen a photograph of the plaque commemorating him and his four comrades. We used to put up flying rations at Mill North for crews of 40 to 45 Lancasters when they went on a mission. While at, while at Milden Hall we received a visit from the King and Queen and the, the then little princesses Elizabeth and Margaret. Two other experiences, meeting royalty, Princess Anne landed by helicopter on our recreation ground at Wickenbrook on November the 5th, 1979. She spoke to Ivy and I about the huge bonfire we'd built on the recreation ground, not yet lit. She visited Malcolm Brown's school for handicapped riders at Berry Road. Apart from meeting the Queen, Duke, Princess Charles, Prince Charles and Princess Anne at the palace, I go way back to 1912. I was five when we had hundreds of troops manoeuvring in the village and King George, I can picture him now, standing at the front door, visited the school where, where, where he had tea. And there's a tablet commemorating the event uh, which was in Unbelway, Mr. Algernon Dunn Gardner of Denston Hall on September 
1912. It has caused a lot of interest, especially when the school, built in 1878, commemorated its centenary in 1978. I had the pleasure of being chairman of the committee organising the event with the headmaster, Mr Clive Blanchard, who is now at the Kangle School, a new school at Haverhill. Incidentally, I attended the school for, for nine years, from five until I was 14. I was taken up the fields from my home, from Colesford Green, uh, by Rose Edgeley, who was 11 at the time. I was five. She became Mrs. Ted Evans and has just recently died in Davis Court Berry at the age of 88. We had a schoolmaster, William Brown. We called him Billy, not so he heard us, though. He used the cane liberally. I was cane to stealing apples, breaking a window and snowballing the girls. And I had to do hundreds of lines. It wasn't too good. Um, however, we weren't as miserable as that. We didn't do the vandalism they do today. However, in the end, he found I was brainy, and I became his star pupil. He prophesied a great future for me. Well, I suppose I haven't done so badly. He moved to Moulton, and I wrote periodically to him until he died at 86, so there were no hard feelings. He once got told to ease up on his cane by the managers. School today appears to be far more interesting, with far greater opportunities than we had, we had the three hours drummed into us, backed up by hard discipline. Mr. Brown was a church warden. I can still remember his morning and evening prayers at school and reading the lesson uh, in the parish church. I seldom went to the parish church, though I and I were married there because her, five, her four sisters were also married there. They had a precise Scottish vicar, the Reverend Alexander McKechnie. He was there 46 years. It was his idea to start a flower show in 1889. We are celebrating 100 years this year. Highlights have been a visit from the BBC Gardeners Question Time when local, uh, when in the local Memorial Social Centre. It was crowded with over 200 people on notable occasions. And the editor, Adam Pascoe of Garden News, was guest speaker at our dinner and social. We have a week of celebration in July culminating in the Flower Show Carnival and Parade on Saturday, July the 15th, which we show a lot of pictures of old times, flower show and books, etc. We now have 70 members. There is keen rivalry between competitors. We have had various cele celebrities over open the event, including the singing postman. And we have accumulated over a dozen trophies given to us over the years. For many years, we had Mr. Justin Brooke, and then Mrs. Edith Brooke as our president. They have passed on. They did a lot for us and the village. And now Mr. Harold Burton fills this position. Memories of flower shows in our youth were the sports, very good local sports, the local Harrison band, and the steam galloping horses. Alas, no more, or at least we don't get them out here in the country. And the organ playing on forever, blowing bowls, etc. The show used to be held at the back of the church, and it was very muddy, and, and Stingy Wright, an old uh, fair proprietor named Stingy Wright, we called him Stingy Wright, he came with his traction engine, beautiful engine, one of Burrell's, and uh, he, he came into this meadow, and he used to get stuck, and he said, I'll never come here again, but he came every year, and he gave us a lot of pleasure. In fact, the flower show was the one, one of the great events we looked forward to during the year. Uh, we hadn't got very much money to spend either. Uh, at, uh, when I was two and a half, incidentally, I went up a ladder up the apple tree at Appleton Green. Uh, my mother panicked and was going to shout, and father said, quiet, he'll come down all right, and I did. At seven, I went to Hannah Brown's postmistress in the village on a Saturday all day for sixpence and my dinner, and often I had great pieces of suet in this dinner, and I was afraid to leave it because the old lady was a real martinet and I used to push them down the crack in the, in the boards. I was very unhappy and had to clean knives, forks with bath brick, break sticks, not allowed a chopper, in case I chopped the fingers. My grandmother had recommended me. Later on, my brother Ted took over. I left to look after cows for Sam Mason. Ted couldn't do anything right 
And the old lady used to tell my grandmother then that I was a gem, but Ted was terrible. Well, he was more honest than I was. And uh, but ever, he always got into trouble. He once knocked one of those beautiful flowers off and he pinned it on uh, with a pin. And uh, during the week, of course, she saw it. He left the tools near the front door and so on. We were very, very poor and father worked when he felt like it and drank regularly. So he brought very little home. And, but when he was called up in the Great War, we became quite rich. Mother had regular allowance. There were seven of us and uh, we, were, we were quite well off. My father died soon after the First World War, only about 40, and I remember wondering as a lad of 14 if he had gone to heaven. Um, the people in my early days who were rich did not want us to become too clever or rich. Us boys touched our caps to the doctor, the squire, and the schoolmaster, and were glad of what they could give us. I remember we had pea soup brought down to us from the hall, the Bromleys, and uh, we were very glad to, to receive anything. And Mr. Fassel Giffords was a very benevolent gentleman. If you saw a boy with a bad pair of shoes on, he would uh, he wouldn't say much to him, but he would go along to the local grocer who sold boots as well, and he would order a pair for him. Before the First War, lots of men worked on the farms for very low wages, about 10 shillings a week. Six days at that, no holiday. Corners cut the solids, and then the sales machine and the binder came in. Three horses pulling the binder. Sometimes I, as a boy, rode the middle horse and had a stick to keep all three going. We gazed, we grazed the crowds along the roadside, and uh, we had to be very careful going past the doctors in case they made a mess in front of the doctors. That would never do. They came. Then came the first motor car. Dr. Wilkin had a car and its number was CF7. CF was the West Suffolk number, so he had the seventh car apparently. Uh, the number one was at Thurston End, uh, near, at Holgerton, CF1. Just before the war, this was, Mr. David Foster, coachman, he became my father in law eventually, he came as a chauffeur to Dr. Wilkin uh, and he had, uh, he eventually became the driver of the car. He learned to drive the car. The chauffeur in those days wasn't protected at all. That was just for the windscreen, no side screens. He was exposed, but he was provided with a very big overcoat and a, and a peak hat. And, uh, well, the passengers rode very comfortably inside. I remember an incident at Stradishall. Mr. Bauer, a very rich man, he, he had his coachman, when the days of coach and horses, uh, drove him to Bury to, um, big dance at the Athenaeum and in the meantime his coachman was down in the kitchen and he'd been drinking quite a bit and when Mr Bauer came out with his lady to uh, for him to drive him this uh, coachman it is said trying to get on the uh, seat to drive the horses fell off and Mr Bauer said you're in no state to drive me I shall have to put you in the coach and drive drive the thing on myself so uh, there it is while with the first war over, we eventually got electricity and then water laid on. Prior to that, the laboratory was some distance down the garden path, and we used to be a bit nervous when it was dark. I remember the first radio set with the cat's whisker, and we had a job to get this cat's whisker on the crystal. The Bromleys, who had been a great influence for good, crashed in the early 20s. The squire went to prison, and then came Justin Brook and he transformed things. And instead of pressing, keeping the people down, he said, I look forward to the time when my, every man of mine will have a motor car. And eventually most of us did, I worked for him for 12 years. And uh, so he was, at 17, I learned to drive a motor. Morris two-seater <coughs> car belonged to Miss Dunn Gardner at Denston Hall. She's still alive. She's Mrs. Harvey Leader. She's about 88. I earned 17 shillings a week. Harry Crapple taught me to drive. I had previously worked for Mr. Percy Willard at the, sh the shop uh, and starting at 8 and 6 at 14. He was very sharp and hard to please and would say, if you can't do this, you're no good to me. I'll have to get somebody else. And uh, I was very much afraid he would. At Christmas, we worked until past midnight. My mate there was Sid Hurrell, who has just died at 82. 
Sometimes we stole a biscuit or two, and sometimes we rebelled, but we didn't get far. One sharp old man came to the shop, Tom Brown. He used to come in for paraffin oil, and he would say, gallon of oil inside the can. I dare spill it. A year or two later, I was taking a donkey to the blacksmith, and I met Tom, and he said, how much for the donkey? And I said brightly, five pounds. His reply was, what, the two? During the war, I stayed with my grandmother. She idolised me, being the first grandchild. Uh, the Zeppelins used to come over, uh, and on a starlight night, they looked like big cigars in the sky as they went over from the east coast to London. Soon they were to become almost, well, sitting ducks for our RAF when the planes got high enough to go over them. When the war started in 1914, our soldiers were called up. They walked to Bury. They'd walked to Bury, and the Germans were already in Belgium. Three of us, uh, as the soldiers, some of the recruits, some of the reserves went up the hill, Fuller's Hill in the village here, to go. We were pulling garlic in a field, in a field of wheat. And the old farmer said to us, I'll give you a silver sixpence if you'll do that. A field, the whole field. We did the whole field, and he gave us sixpence each, so he didn't know a pass, did he? My Uncle Harry was a reservist, and he was called up, and he was captured at Mons. And quite a lot of the uh, several men from this village in the Suffolks were killed at Mons. Uh, he was a prisoner in Germany all through the war. In the Second World War, uh, we um, I was on a milk round at Cambridge when the uh, Chamberlain said that it's the evil things we shall be fighting. And uh, I was with Mr. Justin Brooke then. I was with him for 12 years, selling all sorts of things, milk, roses, fruit trees, and he was a, he did a tremendous lot for the village. All right. Wickenbrook is quite a village, really. We have 11 greens. In fact, we've just found another one called Awkward Green, and we think it's... Uh, it holds the record for the number of greens in a village, and sometime or other, I'm going to write up to the um, Guinness Book of Records. And um, we have about a thousand inhabitants now. Parish Church, all saints, dates back over 700 years. Two chapels, the United Reformed, which used to be congregational, it is now over 300 years, and a Methodist, uh, 150 years old. The local school is. is it was founded in 1978. Uh, two public houses at present, the Greyhound Nunnery Green and the Cloak, used to sell home-brewed beer. This is near Maris Courtney. In 1851, there were seven beer houses in the village. We also have the Plumbers Arms, former hostelry for commercial travellers, half in Denston and half in Wickenbrook. It is said you can sleep with your feet in Wickenbrook and your head in Denston. The Bad Monster Hall dates back to before the Norman Conquest and is mentioned in the Doomsday Book. And uh, there are three manors, Gaines Hall, Clopton Hall and Bad Mondesfield Hall. It's a large scattered village, but not unattractive. Hill and Dale, composed of hamlets, and the tributary of the River Star starts near Easterwood, flows into the Glam and goes on into the Star. One of our oldest institutions is the Annual Flower Show. Um, still very strong, and um, some, about three years ago we formed a, a history society, of which I'm now pleased to be chairman. In fact, it was my idea, and we are doing very, very well. And uh, we have very good speakers. Richard Dix, of course, a great man from Glamshire, now moved to Cavendish. He's a uh, he's a very good speaker. We recently, he spoke to us on the murders of Suffolk, and before that, he spoke on transportation. Incidentally. I had, my great-grandfather was transported to Australia at the age of 27 in 1844 for 15 years, but we cannot trace anything about him since. So there may be somebody very rich in Australia, we better look them up. However, uh, it's very interesting living here. Uh, most of the people are very happy. People come back here to live in retirement. Quite a number of people are coming into the village now we don't want it spoiled, we don't want too much building, we want it to keep its old charm, and uh, I for one am very...
Hello. Tom, Tom, stop. <laughs> Hello, my name is Thomas John Brown. I was born in Glenford on September the 17th, 1916, the third youngest of six boys and three girls. My father was a member of a very old-fashioned Glenford family. I have so far traced our ancestry back to 1602, while my mother came from the Wilton area of London. Financially, we were extremely poor but were very rich in family life and tradition. I started school when I was three years old in what was then the Glenford Elementary School and I left at 14 years of age, that then being the school leaving age. I remained at this school the whole time as was the custom then for most children, unless one won a scholarship or one's parents could afford to pay the fees of a grammar or high school. I progressed through the classes or standards, as they were then known, with all the usual fights and scraps of a normal schoolboy. During the last three or four years of schooling, I had a job as a backers boy at a local baker's, doing all sorts of jobs before school, during a two-hour dinner break and after school. I also helped with the bakehouse and on the delivery rounds. I must have done a total of something like 20 to 25 hours a week for which I was paid one or sixpence a week, that is seven and a half pence today. But money was badly needed at home, and it did buy the equivalent of four to five loaves of bread. A loaf weighed two pounds, they're not the smaller loaf of today. Bread and potatoes formed the major part of my diet then. Meat featured very little, apart from the occasional rabbit caught by the older members of the family or an old hen which had finished its laying life and had to be boiled and boiled to make it edible. I used to earn a few coppers at the seasons came round, picking poppy pups and elderflower, which was bought by a local chemical manufacturing company. As I said at the beginning, we were very hard up. My father was something of a dealer, a rag and bone merchant, etc. But he did not get a good living at this, so he did hedging and ditching when he could selling the faggots, and with my mother would go pea picking, mangled, turnip and swede pulling, also potato picking, and worst of all, stone picking. I would be required to help on all these jobs. Stone picking was hard work, mangled, turnip and swede pulling extremely cold work, as it was always a cold weather job, and it always seemed to be frosty. I had to clean, glean corn also to help feed our few chickens. Christmas was a wonderful time, only a few bits and pieces in the way of presents, but we were a large family and with mate brought in by my elder brothers and sisters and we stayed for the whole holiday, it was a very sociable occasion. Sleeping on the floor, on chairs and on sofas, drinking homemade wine, everybody contributed a song, story, dancing or doing some piece of entertainment, it was a time of great enjoyment. I can cl clearly remember those times. Some of the songs I've never heard since, what a pity, they could not have been recorded. I just remember snatches of some of them. I remember one chap who used to say if he could remember the night before, he could not have enjoyed himself very much. And if he did not get up the next morning and tread on nutshells on your bare feet, then it wasn't Christmas. On leaving school, I worked more or less full time at the baker's my wage now being three and sixpence a week, or seventeen and a half pence. But I did get a cup of cocoa and a bun every day for illnesses. I worked a bit more in the bakehouse and on the rounds. How that delicious smell of newly baked bread was going to haunt me in later years. This wage was not enough to live on, and there was no government support system operating then. If you did not work on leaving school, you got nothing at all. I looked for another job, but had no immediate luck. To widen my scope, I had to get a bike. One of the gang lent me one to learn on. It had no brakes, no chain, no tyres or inner tubes. Huge 28 inch frames with wheels one and a half inches wide. I would get to the top of the hill, mount the bike and try to keep on. Of course there were plenty of spills, but I mastered it eventually. There was virtually no motor traffic at this time, especially on country lanes. I decided to try my luck at domestic service. One job in London at a pound a month living in. 
I wondered why this establishment employs so many so-called nursemaids. After all, there was only one small child. I found out later when I read it had been raided by the police. Such was my introduction to the seamy side of life. I then got a job at Woodbridge at what is now the Sackbert Hall Hotel. It was privately owned then. But these jobs didn't last long. This was not my type of work. My next venture was as a butcher's errand boy and general assistant in Sudbury. My hours were 60 per week, not counting the seven mile journey there and back. My pay was 18 shillings a week, that's 90 pence. After a month, it went up to a pound a week. Work was hard to come by then in those days and I accepted these conditions without question. I bought a, build, a new bike on the installment system. £2.50 it cost, and I paid six pounds a week for it. I joined all the local associations, Men's Institute, Red Cross, Amateur, Dramatic, Dart Clubs, etc. One day while making sausages, I caught my hand in the mincing machine, severing a joint off one finger. I was off work for five weeks with no pay of any description. I eventually got a compensation payment of £25. I had very little in the way of holidays, but my brother and I did bike to Brighton for a few days. We had one pound between us. We intended to sleep rough, but the police kept moving us on. They compelled us to get lodging for the rest of our stay. We did for just one night. Bed and breakfast, it cost five shillings or 25 pence for the two of us. We could not afford a second night, so we had to come home. I remember we called an all-night cafe and heard the Tommy Fargio and Louis fight in America on the cafe radio. I went on occasional Saturday night excursions to shows in London, the Palladium and the Windmill. These were the days of Harry Champion, the Crazy Gang, Mac Miller, Albert Whelan and the famous Windmill Girls. I think the train fare was half a crown, special for London, two shillings for South End and one and six to Clapham. I had to go to Sudbury Market most Thursdays to collect pigs, which the boss had bought. We used a light cart, my mate in the shafts and me pushing at the back. We had some hairy times when the pigs broke through the net and escaped into the Market Hill stalls. Many were the rippled comments uh, aimed at us. I acquired a radio band then and remember the radio dance bands of the day. Roy Fox, Harry Roy, Bert Ambrose, Carol Gibbons, Henry Hall. Lou Stone, Jack Payne, De Broy Summers being a them. At the age of 21, my wage went up by a shilling a week. By this time, I was a fairly experienced butcher, including slaughterhouse work, so at 21 shillings a week, I wasn't exactly overpaid. After three years here, I moved to another butchering job at Long Melford at 30 shillings a week, and I felt really well off. One of the jobs here was to meet the Saturday afternoon train, unload beef cattle bought in the Bungie area markets and drive them down the street to our own premises. This could be, and often was, a hair raising experience too. This job brought me up to the declaration of war and I had to register for national service. At the medical inspection which I passed okay, I was interviewed by a seemingly kind old colonel who asked me what I would like to join. Having proficiency certificates and even more qualifications in all branches of the Red Cross work, I opted for the medical corps to be told, no, we're full up there. I then asked to follow my trade in the service corps to get the same reply. No, you will have to go into the infantry, he said. So much for preferences on square pegs and round holes. Ironically, an elder brother of mine who had to register a little later was asked the same question. He was a skilled bricklayer and opted for the service corps or pioneers. He was sent to the medical corps. Such was the logic of army thinking then. So on April 2nd, 1940, I ceased to be made and became 6022186 Private T.J. Brown, 2nd 5th Battalion of the Essex Regiment. My first week's pay was five shillings and I do not remember ever receiving the King's shilling. I did most of my home training in the Northumberland area and just before Christmas 1940 embarked to Greenwich on the troop ship near Radio, bound for foreign lands. On Christmas Day our convoy was attacked by the German battleship Hipper. 
There was great excitement as a short naval engagement took place. We landed from Freetown, Sierra Leone, on the west coast of Africa, part of what was known as the White Man's Grave, on account of a large number of deaths there from tropical diseases. I enjoyed my stay there in spite of the intense and sticky heat. Everything was so exotic. One camp actually on the water's edge. The sights and sounds of the jungle were thrilling. I went on one expedition there climbing Sugarloaf Mountain and Pickett Hill. Pickett Hill was particularly difficult, cutting through thick jungles, felling trees to cross rivers, scaling sheer rock. It had last been climbed in 1931, all attempts since then having failed. We succeeded and raised the green flag of C Company on the summit, so we had good excuse to celebrate our return to camp. After six months here, we embarked for Egypt, spending a week in Durham in South Africa, en route, where the hospitality was overwhelming. We were given the complete freedom of the town. Then on to the line at Ile de France and onto Egypt, where we landed at the end of July 1941. We were occupied several positions here until December 1941, when we moved to Iraq, passing through what was then Palestine, crossing the River Jordan, through Syria to Mosul in Iraq, where we arrived at Christmas Day. The weather was absolutely atrocious, deep snow and mud. There were many adventures here too. We left, left Iraq in June 1942, heading back to the Western Desert, passing through Damascus, Palmyra with all its marble columns, past Nineveh and onto Acre, to a camp once used by the Crusaders. Onto Haifa, where we entrained for the front, which we reached after many hair-raising experiences on about the 27th of June 1942. We took up our positions at a spot on the map marked Derashid, about eight miles east of Alamein. After an all-out attack by Rommel's Africa Corps, which we were not in a position and not equipped to resist for long, the order was given at 6 p.m. on July the 2nd, 1942, for us to surrender. What a humiliating, undignified experience that is. Crawling out of slit trenches, discarding our rifles, hands held high in the air, surrounded with the enemy, pointing machine guns and automatic rifles at you, ready cop for immediate use, backed up by the huge tanks and self-propelled guns of the German army. So I entered into another phase of my life, that of a prisoner of war. It was harrowing getting back behind the lines, and the British artillery did more shelling there than they did during the engagement. Also, we were under constant attack from the bombers of the Royal Air Force, many of the shells of bombs falling amongst us. I now found the desert, which had been such a lovely, glamorous, romantic place at times, with its warm sands, beautiful starlight nights, Stars which seemed so close you could almost pluck them from the velvet sky. Honey coloured moon filling the sky could become very hostile. Bitterly cold at night with no blanket to warm me. It actually froze on two nights and incredibly it snowed a little one night. Some of the Arabs did not even know what this phenomenon was. The moon gave light to the night bombers which continually harassed us. There was no water other than the rusty water which we drained from the radiators of broken down vehicles. We did not drink it. We rinsed our mouths with it, spit it out into an old selfish tin and used it over and over again until it became so slimy it could be used no more. It seemed as though the desert had rejected us. The searing midday sun pouring its blistering heat down on the, us relentlessly with all the pitless ferocity it could muster. We received an occasional mouthful of water some days later, and the tiniest amount of food imaginable. Dried prunes and army biscuit. It couldn't have been more inappropriate. We were compelled to march on through the horrid heat, many falling by the wayside. Eventually some transport arrived, and we were taken to a watery place. What a blessed relief after four days in that blazing inferno, without a spot of shade on a total of about one pint of water. So by stages we passed through Mersa Matru, Sid Barani, Tobruk, where I found an old sack which served me as a blanket in the night to come, on to Dirna and Benghazi. There were many incidents on the way, all of them potentially very dangerous for us, 
especially as the guards were now treating happy Italians or Libyans, determined to demonstrate that they were now the masters. Finally, we came to another camp where I had my first shaves and capture. I found a discarded razor blade in the sand, borrowed a razor, wetted my face with cold water, no soap, and hacked away. It was absolute torture, but I felt better afterwards. All I had with me when captured was a pair of shorts, a shirt, vest, pants, steel helmet, paper, book, and identity disc, which I was wearing at the time. Here I learned to cook captures of palm fronds for food, making a fire from twigs ignited by means of a piece of glass and the sun. From here, I, with 4,000 others, were put on a small merchant vessel of 1,000 tons bound for Italy. It was so crowded that we had to take turns lying down. Sanitary arrangements were just buckets placed in the hold. It was appalling and nauseous. We were given a couple of Italian army biscuits as a bully beef, horsemen I believe, and told to make it last two days. We had to run the court of the Royal Navy in submarines, but we arrived at Taranto in southern Italy on July the 23rd. Into railway wagons and onto Brindisi, where we were paraded through the town and marched 10 or 12 miles to a prisoner of war camp. Here I was given a blanket and part of a Red Cross parcel. No other, no other food, and I had my first cup of tea for three weeks. I put some water in an old tin, put some tea, sugar and powdered milk in the water, made a fire from straw and the cardboard cotton, and after an hour produced a cup of tea. The water did not boil, it tasted a smoke, two leaves floated on top, milk was lumpy, but there never was a better cup of tea, it was pure nectar. Then on to other camps, some filthy and revolting, with almost non-existent toilet facilities. In finestrable quantities of food, I became in common with everybody else lice infested. And what a horrible, degrading condition that is. With almost no food, I became extremely weak, but managed to escape the diseases that broke out all around me. Several of my comrades died from malnutrition and disease. Many, many collapsed on the roll calls. Moving from one particular camp, we were cooped up in a goose wagon. So crowded we could not even sit down properly for 33 hours, having only one stop, a comfort stop it was called, out in the open country. The tiniest amount of food was given us. We never had a meal before leaving a camp, nor on arriving at a fresh camp. This was to make escape more difficult. At one camp known as PG-73, my hair was short, so it was completely bald. The equipment used was similar to the old-fashioned sheep shearing gear used at home. I was then shaved with a very blunt cutthroat razor. I had grown a very long beard by then. I was given some rough but clean clothes. I tried to wash my own clothes, but they had been so sweat-soaked and sun-dried that they just disintegrated. My vest and pants had long since fallen off me. I had no underwear. I was also given a sliver of non lathering soap the first piece of soap I have seen for two months. September the 13th, 1942 was a red letter day, as I received a letter from home. So now they knew I had, I had survived so far. On the 17th, my birthday, I received a parcel from home, containing a toothbrush and paste, razor and blaze and other things, which are of absolutely no reports at all until you haven't got them. Things like needle and thread, shoelaces, this did make life a little bit easier. Life began to settle down. I received a, received a British Army uniform, which I had to desecrate by the addition of large red patches denoting prisoner of war status. I did not have to work in Italy. The Italian surrender brought great rejoicing amongst us, but on awakening the next morning, ready to make our way to our own lines, we were bitterly disappointed to find that as we were celebrating our impending departure the previous night, the Germans had surrounded camp with troops, machine guns and armoured cars, with the Italian guards locked up in an every compound. Some men did escape, most were soon brought back, some recaptured, unharmed, some badly wounded, and some as corpses. It was a day of extreme shock and depression, and ended that phase of my prisoner's career. 
The next day started off badly. Three days without food, then a tiny portion of bread made from acorn and chestnut flour. On the fourth day, I was again shepherded into a grossly overcrowded cattle truck to start the next phase of my life as a prisoner of war, this time in Germany. This was to be a pretty grueling phase too. Escape from Asia on the train, but everyone was soon picked up again. Up through Austria, we were in this wagon for two days and nights, with just two stops for a little revolting food and toilets. We eventually arrived at the most filthy, revolting camp imaginable, as also was the next one. Here I was documented, photographed and fingerprinted, and thus became prisoner of war number 247978, base camp Stalag 4B, 100 miles south of Berlin. At 4B, some freedom fighters from one of the occupied countries stormed the camp to release the prisoners. The raid was a failure. The fighters were captured and killed in cold blood. I was glad when I was told I was being sent to another camp, but this time it would be to work. I was not so happy about that. In the middle of October 1943, a hundred of us were put into two railway wagons and headed north. I'm oh, sorry, that's south. I was stuck in my truck for 24 hours. We came to a place about 20 miles from Dresden. This camp was, in fact, a large house. I was put to work down at ore mine, which was in the process of development. I had to walk three and a half miles each way to and from work. The food here was atrocious, hardly sufficient to work, support life, let alone work. It consisted mostly of cabbage soup, potatoes, beetroot, with some black bread, a tiny portion of us at large, and acorn coffee. Other foods were supposed to be on the menu, but were virtually undetectable. Meat, fat, cheese, jam and sugar. We had to steal potatoes and turnips and swedes from the fields when we could, but this was risky too. Conditions were so bad, we became so weak, that on November, November the 8th, 1943, we decided to stage a prisoner's strike. On arrival at the mine, we said we could not work unless conditions and rations improved. It was a bitterly cold day. Troops soon arrived armed with machine guns, which they set up, loaded, and caught ready for firing. We were ordered to go to work or face the firing squad. This, they said, was mutiny. We were refused and were kept standing literally frozen to the ground for all of the nine hour shift, not even being permitted to relieve ourselves. We eventually had to give in, of course. I received a three-day prison sentence on bread and water as a penalty. Twelve ounces of dry black bread and one pint of water per day. With the eleven others, I was locked in an underground dungeon in the pitch black with a pile for a toilet, which was not emptied during the whole of the three days. The fetid air atmosphere was sickening. No exercise was permitted. Conditions did improve for a very short period afterwards. My work there mate down the mine with an old man, pro-German, but very anti-Nazi. He had a son who was studying English and came to the mine to practice his English on me. This had been authorised on condition that a German guard was present to ensure that we did not discuss the war or politics. Typical of German authority, the guard could not understand a word of English. Time dragged on, conditions again deteriorated, I became so weak from lack of food that I often wondered and feared what the outcome could be. I could hardly walk, but still had to go to work, and I became skeletal. We were also put under great stress by German propaganda. Life became extremely difficult, even precarious. We were only kept going by the receipt of a share of the occasional Red Cross parcel. The last four months were a waking nightmare. Many collapsed from starvation, but were still forced to work. The mental strain of all the rumours and the waiting for the relief forces, whether British, American or Russian, took a very heavy toll. We also came in for a lot of bombing and strafing. We had a grandstand view of those horrific air raids on Dresden. We wandered about our camp and village with survivors continual shelling and bombing. At last, after some very heavy shelling, bombing, strafing and retaliatory fire, 
and a fierce tank battle on the road by the camp outside our village. It was entered by Russian cavalry at midnight on the day after the war officially ended. So we became free men again, but the last few months had all worse weakness. I eventually reached the American lines after continual obstruction by the Russians in a breakless, engineless, doorless van towed by another van, which in its turn was towed by a bus. A hazardous 20 mile journey which took 12 hours. The next day another 60 miles to the British lines, then a further 50 miles to an airfield where I boarded a bomber and flew to Brussels, arriving on the 16th of May and once more came under the jurisdiction of the British Army. Thus ended the saga of the prison camp for me. On to England, my first glimpse being those famous white cliffs. What a thrilling sight that was. Home on extended leave and what a fantastic welcome I received. I soldiered on, merely token soldiery now, until I was demobbed. It was April 4th, 1946. I had done six years and two days. Taking up the threads of civilian life again, I invested my small gratuity in a one-man butcher business, but after six years I had to close it down. The meat rash was too tiny for me to make a living. A short time in the construction industry, a short time at the local flax factory, finally ending my working life after nearly 27 years at the local manufacturing chemical works. This then is a brief outline of the first 60 odd years of my life. I'm now approaching my 73rd year. I'm Maurice Finbo, born in London on July the 23rd, 1916. My parents kept the village store opposite the school and it was there that I was born. A lifelong friend, Lawrence Stern, was also born at Hundon three weeks before me. Our mothers walked us out in our prams together and our friendship remains strong to this day. His father was headmaster of Hundon School and was known as the strict disciplinarian. A brilliant, brilliant maths man and his, and his son took after him winning a scholarship to Oxford, and he became one of the boffins at Farnborough Aircraft Establishment and head of the Aircraft Research Station at Bedford. I have many happy memories of my young days, visits to my grandmother at Elmshall, and meeting my uncles and aunts and many cousins who were farming at Backton and Finningham. I also remember a gentle girl named Beatrice Taylor who my parents employed to look after me. She is still alive and living at Kennington, or Kitten as it's now called. Sadly she lost her only son in a road accident last year. One of the hair raising stories she tells is of taking me for my usual daily walk and having returned to the shop she left the pram outside Hearing my parents' alarm cries, she rushed to the shop door in time to see the pram disappearing under the front of the stream steamroller. Luckily, she had previously removed me, much to my parents' great relief. Growing up as an only child in a small village was a pleasant time for me, but I was not aware of the hardships being borne by most of the community. I remember the great cheeses coming into the shop and being stored with my father for up to 12 months. At Christmas, wooden barrels of grapes, sweet and juicy, were a great treat and I still enjoy a bunch of grapes to this day. On the other side of the coin, I remember the tramps coming from the workhouse at Kennington en route to the next workhouse at Sudbury calling at the shop to see if there were any dregs left in the tobacco drawer. In the, those days, tobacco or shag was sold loose. My mother loved music and belonged to the choral society at Clare. She and others walked to Clare in all weathers for practice. Monday was slaughtering day for Mr Jolly the Butcher, grandfather of Doreen Hale who still lives in Cavendish. 
some of us boys were more than happy to hang on to a rope which was attached to a bullock and pass through a hole in the slaughterhouse wall whilst being slaughtered. I can remember my father having his first motor car. It was Christmas Day in the 1920s. He took me into the yard and opened the shed door and there, instead of a motorcycle and sidecar, stood a bull-nosed Morris Oxford with a dicky seat. One Christmas we had been to my grandmother's at Elmshaw. Uh, on, on my father's motorbike and sidecar and we got stuck in the snowdrift near Denston Plummer's Arms. We found our way to Woolard's, the grocers in Wickenbrook, and they put my mother and I up for the night and my father walked back to Hundon some four to five miles in deep snow so that he could open his shop in the morning. When I was nine years old, my parents decided to send me to a boarding school. And as we were Methodists, it was natural to choose the East Anglian School, now Colford School, and it was then in Berris and Edmonds. There began some of the happiest days of my life. Unfortunately, perhaps, I neglected academic opportunities and devoted myself to sport. My friend Lawrence Stern also joined me at the school. The head of the school was Dr Skinner, a truly wonderful man. He knew every one of us by name and we were one big happy family. Food was awful, but the staff joined us for meals and ate the same as the pupils. Tuck boxes were a necessity, as all we had after midday lunch was six slices of bread with butter or marge. Sunday was special. We had some jam and a piece of slab cake. Also on Sundays we wore black striped trousers and black jacket with an Eton collar and bow tie, a cap in winter and a straw hat in summertime. We walked in Crocodile mornings and evenings to the Wesleyan Chapel in Looms Lane in Berris and Edmonds. I can remember singing in a concert at the Sunday school Christopher Robin saying his prayers. Can you imagine me doing that? I remember a severe flu epidemic at the school. Most of the boys were ill in bed. One boy, Dixon, died. He was son of one of the owners of Ridley's in Abigate Street. It was around this time that I became dangerously ill with a mastoid. I was attended by the school medical officer, Dr. O'Mara, and he and Dr. Skinner decided to take me to the old Berry Hospital, as on that particular day a visiting EMT consultant was on his once a month visit to Berry Hospital. I was wrapped up in blankets and taken by Dr. Skinner in his old bean car and operated on straight away. I believe I owed my life to their swift action and the coincidence of the London doctor being there that day. I remember going to camp with the school scouts at Cavern and although only 11 to 12 years old, played cricket for the scouts 11 against Cavern and village team. This was possibly the beginning of my lifelong interest and enjoyment in the game of cricket. I had many friends in the school and contrary to general belief there was very little bullying went on. Many of those fr friendships have been maintained to this present day. Unfortunately some have died, others were killed in the war of 1939-45. I still have a strong link with George Purvis, formerly of Fox Earth, who was my maths master. In a recent letter, he remembered me going into bat. My, uh, my batting pads nearly as tall as I was. I'm still a short bloke. Another dear friend is Bernard Farr, who was my geography master. We still meet and enjoy each other's company. We are often joined by Dr Skinner's daughter, Mary, who married Henry Willis from Clare. Another close friend is Derek Yallop, who is now president of the Sudbury Football Club.
He was centre forward in the school first team in which I played. He scored 40 goals in one season, which is a record for the school. In 1932, the school staged a production of Midsummer Night's Dream. I played the part of Puck and had a tremendous write-up in the Berry Free Press, forecasting a future for me on the stage. I haven't been on the stage since. I received my school colours for hockey, cricket and football, which shows where my preference lay. And apart from a low school certificate pass, my academic achievements were non-existent. I left school in 1935 when the country was still in the Depression. After a year at home helping with my father's business, my father decided to retire. He sold a shop and we moved to Glemsford, and I started poultry farming. I soon became involved with the Billy's Cricket Club, and can remember having to approach the late Mr. Collis Goodchild concerning the use of the Grove Meadow, for which he charged the sum of five pounds. Quite often this was returned. I found the conditions, playing conditions vastly different from school. The cows also used the field, and I can remember going to Kentwell Hall and asking Sir Connor Guthrie if we could buy the surround of posts and chains and sockets from their cricket ground as they were moving. He agreed to sell them and we reassembled them around the square at Glemsford, thus keeping the cows off the field. Little did I realise then that a girl working at that time at Kentwell Hall would become my second wife. Our old pavilion was the old body of a bus which we bought for five pounds from Bertie Brown's garage, which is now full of leisure. I remember most of the team of those days. They were Albert Beavers, Will Beavers, Charlie Sawyer, Arthur Wordley, Cliff Potter, Harry Lee, Archie Claridge, Cecil Meelan, Arthur Meelan, who was killed during the war, Frank Chrysler and myself. In those days, 60 or 70 runs was considered a good score because the outfield on most village grounds was only cut for hay. I also played hockey for Sudbury and Halstead, who played their home matches on the present Halstead cricket ground. At that time, Court, Colonel Court, Portway was captain and he was the owner of the Tortoise Stove Factory in Halstead. Lander Steed, a solicitor from Sudbury, and Robert Gould, an old school co colleague who owned, his father owned the horsehair factory at Clemsford. Others in the team escaped my memory. Also before the war, Tom Ambrose from Cavendish called at my home to ask if I would play cricket on a Sunday. My parents were horrified. During this time, we had no Sunday paper at my home. I used to go to the paper shop in the village with Harry Lee and buy a paper in Mrs. Betts's paper shop. Our daily papers came from the same shop and were daily delivered by horse and trap by Charlie Sawyer, father of Eddie Sawyer. I was then persuaded to join Glimpson Football Club, eventually becoming captain. Until, until the outbreak of war we had one of the most successful junior teams in the area. The team consisted of Rufus Brown, who ran a fish and chip shop in Long Melford, Charlie Sparks, who has now died, Alan Mayhew, Sidney Shin, Dimmer Golding, Charlie Sawyer, who never let the right wing get past him more than once, Charlie Heard, Dick Farthing, Oscar Merkin, known as Ock, Dickie Golding, Billy Gridley, and myself. Oscar Merkin's name conjures, conjures many memories. An excellent centre forward who scored many goals for our club. I can still hear the cry from the touch line, give the ball to Ock, and he would charge down the ground on many occasions. A goalkeeper and Hock would end up in the back of the net. And that was in the days when the goalkeeper had no protection from the referee. We played at that time on the Lion Road ground. I recall a cricket tour I arranged 
playing at Lowestoft, Thorpness and Haverhill, finishing up having a dinner at the Black Lion, which cost the princely sum of two and six. These happy days were to finish with the declaration of war in 1939. Like most of my generation, I felt I had to join up and went to the recruiting office at Colchester. I was asked if I could drive and said yes and was directed to the Army Service Corps. I was sent to Gibraltar bar Barracks at Berris and Edmonds for my initial training. I was then transferred to a company at Blavenham. It was a hard, cold winter of 1940 and we were billeted in Water Street in an old horse air factory, now the Blavenham Press. Most of the window, windows were missing and we slept on the floor and washed in cold water in the outside yard. A considerable number of the lads went down with flu and were sent to St. Leonard's Hospital and Berry Hospital. Some of them unfortunately died. I was fortunate in that I knew Bert Huffy, the local bats blacksmith, who lived with his sister and brother-in-law, the Robinsons, who ran a local baker's shop in Lavenham. Bert came to visit me every day, bringing a thermos of hot soup and one of tea. Luckily, after a week, I recovered. But I felt I owed a lot to that good man. Our next move was to Dalesford House, a lovely old mansion near Chipping Norton. A few weeks there, and we embarked with our troop-carrying vehicles to France. One and two others were allotted the Lewis machine gun truck. Uh, we had never seen a Lewis gun before and had no training in its use, yet we were supposed to protect our convoy with this outmoded weapon. We went from Southampton to Le Havre and on into France, and for a short time we were stationed in Rouen, made very welcome by the French, this was the time of the phony war and we had a pleasant time and we had a pleasant time. When the Germans invaded the Low Countries we moved rapidly into Belgium, greeted by the population with garlands of flowers. However, we were soon being driven back by the German blitzkrieg. No one seemed to know what was happening. I remember vividly being in Bayeux and being attacked by the Stukas dive bombers and seeing two of our dispatch riders blown from their motorcycles and killed. We took cover in the church with the local population. I can remember the walls of the church being shaken by the bombing, but by some miracle the walls held. The three of us who had had the truck were on our own, the only remnants, the remnants of our convoy. We were told to proceed to Dunkirk, but this was made difficult by all the refugees on the roads. We reached Potteringe and were told by an officer that we could proceed no further in the truck and were given an order to destroy the gun and the truck. We had no food or drink and found the population unwilling even to give us water. Having walked some 20 miles, we arrived on the outskirts of Dunkirk were told to walk by the sand dunes to La Pan on the coast, which was on the Belgian border. Memories of our time on the beach are hazy. I remember the terrible bombing. The sand helped to lessen the damage done, but it was still a very unpleasant experience, and many of our lads died. Eventually, I remember walking along the repaired mole at Dunkirk and getting onto a boat. I cannot remember the crossing, but remember finding myself at Lark Hill on Salisbury Plain with no equipment, just wearing trousers and a shirt. The officer in charge told us we could go home for the weekend. I gladly accepted the railway pass and headed for Glemsford. Eventually arriving in Sudbury, there was no train to Glemsford, but I managed to get onto one of Long's buses to home. The company was then reformed and we were sent to a mining village in Yorkshire, billeted out with the villagers. It was my first experience of a mining village. I was shocked by the conditions under which the miners worked and lived. I was 
billeted with a couple who had two, age, two teenage children and was made very welcome, but they were not minors. I managed to play a little cricket whilst I was there. The standard of play was much higher than I was used to. Our next move was to Colchester to be a church hall where we stayed for 12 to 14 months. Despite the war, it was a fairly uneventful and peaceful period. It was during this time that I met the girl from Kentwell Hall. She had moved away to London and been bombed out twice, had returned to her home in Bournemouth and work, was working for the Ministry of Supply to Britannia Works Colchester and lodging in Colchester. She occasionally came to Sudbury on the bus and that is where we met both travelling to Sudbury. I left Colchester and returned to Yorkshire and we lost contact. We were then sent to Morley near Leeds and I was able to visit the people I was previously billeted with. And it was there that I met their niece and fell in love with her. My wife to be was teaching in Barnsley and we met at every opportunity. We planned to get married but D-Day came and all leave was cancelled. In the event, we didn't get married until 1947. Two days after D-Day, we barked on a landing craft to France. I was in charge of four petrol tankers and the drivers. The crossing was uneventful and we landed at Aramanches. We moved up as far as Bayeux and Calm, where we supplied our frontline troops with petrol. Eventually the frontline troops broke through the German lines and we moved on to Belgium and Holland. In both countries I met a family with whom I still keep in touch. We, mo we moved on into Germany where I stayed until the war, en the war ended. Um, my father was then taken ill with cancer and I was given compassionate leave and through the good offices of Colonel Hamilton, Labour MP for Sudbury, I got my release. My war was comparatively easy. I was involved in no heroics. I left the army with the resolve that I would do all I could to, to, to help build a better world having seen so much and learned a great deal about life, I returned to Glemsford and started poultry farming again, went on to the local parish council and was instrumental with others in obtaining a playing field for Glemsford. I soon became involved with soccer and cricket again, but as there was no available ground for cricket, I joined the Cavendish Cricket Club, whose captain was Tom Ambrose who was an outstanding cricketer and one of the most colourful characters I have ever met. He was chosen to play for Suffolk, but the war intervened and all cricket was halted. The present cricket ground and pavilion at Cavendish was his brainchild. His inspiration and friendship has, not has motivated me to continue my interest both in the ground and the players to this day. As president I keep in close contact with what is going on. Tom will be remembered by cricketers for his indomitable spirit, kind and generous to all, but on the cricket field he became a martinet. I can remember most of the names of those connected with cricket in that period. It was Henry and John Dennis, Vic Ives, Teach Mortlock, Joe Hale, Ben Wicks, Vic Keaton, Oscar Merkin, who died on the Melford Cricket Gown in his 53rd year, Ernie Plough, Jim Orwell, George Fenn, Stanley and Bill Bullock, Hugh Glover, Basil Ambrose, Richard Mansell, Guy Agnew, Jack Barlow, John Garrett, Harry Cutmore and his wife Alva, who with Fred and Ivy Brown were responsible for the excellent cricket teams for so many years. Also 
There was Roger Staples, Gordon Staples, Peter Raven, Lord Fenn, Robert Campbell, Roger Gray, Buster Keaton, Philip Ince, who scored, and Bill Page, who scored for many years before and just after the war. I must apologise for those that I have missed out. OK. These are only a few of many people who contributed so much to village cricket. When I finished playing soccer, I was persuaded to join Sudbury Hockey Club again and played with Bob Ellison, Doug Rhodes, Peter Shepperson, Basil Ambrose, John Nock, Tim Orville, Mike Hawkins, Morris Clover, Peter Clayton, John Grimwood, John Dennis, and others whose names escape me at this time. My days of hockey ended when I was asked to play in goal and my thumb was broken. I was in hospital for one week. My greatest love was for cricket and I continued to play until I was about 60 years old. I can remember Tom playing when he was 70 years old. I gave up poultry for keeping in 1963 and joined Coleman and Company Agricultural Limited at Sudbury where I spent many happy years until I retired in 1980. My wife taught at St Gregory's and St Peter's School in Sudbury from 1947 for over 30 years. Our hopes and plans for a happy retirement were dashed by my wife's illness culminating in her death from cancer in 1981. That, that was soon after we had moved to Cavendish. By a strange coincidence, um, through Derek Yallop and his wife, I again met the girl from Bournemouth. Alone, with three grown-up children, five grandchildren, and on December the 20th, 1986, we were married in Sudbury with a reception at Kentville Hall. She often says that it was very nice to sweep in instead of be sweeping out. I was fortunate that I was able to do donate a sum of money which enabled some new changing rooms to be erected next to the pavilion and the cricket ground. Lads from the cricket and football club spent many hours refurbishing the old pavilion, culminating in the opening on Sunday, May the 29th, 1988, by the Duke of Devonshire, and a visit from a team of players from Cavendish, Australia. It was a day I was very proud of and a very moving day. It saddened me very much when David Seagat, who had helped so much and inspired all with this venture, he collapsed and died recently on the Melbourne Cricket Ground. He was only 46. I am now 72 years old. I consider that I have been a lucky man and have had a happy and active life. I have suffered two heart attacks recently but have recovered very well and am able to spend time in my garden and travel which I enjoy. I hope to have a few more years to go and that I will see the envisaged improvement to the Grand Academy Sports Club completed. That's it. <laughs> well, I'm very happy I met you again, aren't I? <laughs> and I'm very happy I met you again, and so are my children and the grandchildren. Um, the two younger, there, um, and there are three others. And we are very happy. It's always distressing when Morris has a heart attack. But he is getting better, aren't you? Mm. His biggest bugbear now is having to give up smoking his pipe. It makes him quite irritable. But I'm not sure that it's the best thing for him to give it up because it is frustrating. But we have a very happy time together. We both love gardening. 
We swear about it there sometimes, don't we? Because mm. there's so much. We love travelling. We've been to West Indies, Australia, South Africa, France, Belgium. Mm. Where else? Well, well, Most well. of all, we love a little island off Malta called Gozo, where we spend our first holiday mm. together to see if mm. we could live together and mm. get on all right. <laughs> and we go there every year. We always feel it's like a second home. I moved to Bulma after having lived at Nayland and Acton. Moved to Bulma when I was nine years old and went to Bulma school. And there I met Phyllis Yallop. It was a very charismatic meeting. And Phil and I divided the school between us, her side and my side, which culminated in a, quite a fight and a bit of bloodletting. But since that time, we've been great friends through all the years. And Phil knows me better than anyone else. And she's the only person I have left who belonged to my childhood. Her mother and father were absolutely marvellous to me. I worked at Kenkel Hall, which was quite an experience. I left Kenkel Hall and went to London. You can remember Freddie Roos yes. cycling up the drive at Kenkel Hall with the ice. For the ice eye. blocks for the eye. I, for the ice box yeah. because even there there were no refrigerators this was before the war of course and I think the, the Guthrie's were very very good for Long Melford and certainly helped the tradesmen with their custom um, when you went to London I went to London and worked for Lord Plender. Um, came the war, and I belonged to the Red Cross, did quite a bit of nursing. Got bombed out twice and thought I wouldn't stay for the third time. Came back to Bournemouth and went to work in Colchester at the Technical College, which was a training school for engineers and I thought yes I'll be an engineer and I hadn't been there very long before the foreman said Miss Coe I don't think you'll ever be an engineer and I must say I, I agreed with him and it so happened there were so many women there at that time because of my Red Cross nursing experience they asked me if I would become the first aider for the school, which I did, and from there I went to Britannia Works as the first aid, in charge of first aid post there. And there I met my first husband, who was a pilot, Spitfire pilot. We married and I lived in Ipswich. I had to work. I became, first of all, a supervisor in a workshop for blind people, a job which I enjoyed immensely. But then I became a child care officer. And for 10 years, and when, when the uh, childcare department merged with other disciplines and became social services. I became a senior social worker and worked for other eight years all in Ipswich. Unfortunately, my marriage failed at that point. But the children were grown up, so it wasn't all that painful. 
And it was after that that, <coughs> through a sheer coincidence involving Derek and Phil Yallop, and I met Maurice again, and um, we eventually married. And he inherited three children and five grandchildren. Is there anything no. else to add to that? No, no, I don't think so, dear. So please, I have the grandchildren. That we bought to put all our odds and bits. I'm a great collector of odds and bits. I can't bear to throw anything away. <laughs> <laughs>